Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm supposed to take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value payment, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. <laughs> oh my gosh, we had to start it at this time because if we would have started it 10 seconds ago, 20 seconds ago, you would have had a uh, heard a dirty joke by Tom. Yes or no? Yes. A bad joke. It was amazing. From though. Tom having to do with something that vibrates a lot. But we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. An Anyways. epileptic stock hey. analyst. <laughs> yeah, an epileptic uh, <laughs> uh, stock analyst. Anyways, yeah. we got Jed in the house. Jed yeah. Diabila in the house. Just crossed 200,000 subs. Put a link below. If you haven't yet subscribed, there you are, there you go are. find our show. We got Vinny Oshana Come here about the Red the House. We did a special clip recently, me and you. Jim Acosta, we were in so, uh, Ukraine or Russia. Where was it at? We were in, you we're have to about, see it to see we're it. We're fun about Ukraine. Vinny's in the house. <laughs> we got Tom Ellsworth, BizDoc, Monday morning in the house. He got a lot of stuff to hello, talk hello, about hello. with business. Obviously, uh, uh, we got a lot of stories to go through, ton to discuss. Jed is here to give us her uh, point of view on what's going on with Tucker. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. Ooh, Who's right. going to replace him? You've been at Fox before. You work there. You work with pretty much everybody. And so we want to see what you have to say about that. Tom's got some opinions about the market. I thought it was going to be Vinny, but today's going to be Tom. You're welcome. About what happened with <laughs> First Republic Bank and FDIC. Uh, uh, what happened there? Why is Jamie Dimon all excited about First Republic and partially getting the government to get involved to buy the dirty paper? Anyways, we'll talk about that. Big tech earnings spark hope that the worst is over. Yet at the same time, home prices in March posted biggest annual decline in 11 years. There's a building, a $300 million building in San Francisco that's fully empty pretty much. And they're saying it'll trade possibly for 60 $200 million today if you want to make an offer. No one's in that building, and it's at the cream of the crop area in San Fran. Charlie Munger issues warning for commercial property market, which is not looking good for that. A uh, story here. I almost didn't believe it until Vinny had to show it to me over and over and over again. From transgender to transabled, I, I don't even now people are choosing to <laughs> identify as handicapped. I explained this to Jen last night. She's like, babe, what are you talking about? I said, I'm telling you. This is a real story. Any The average person you explain this to makes no sense. I know you have some thoughts on oh, that. God. RFK <clears throat> Jr. poses uh, biological males comp competing in women's sports. Jets, you got thoughts on that? We have a, a surprising surge of faith among young people. Furious religious groups combat Satan Khan with intense prayer. Vinny, you got some thoughts on that. So does Jed. Vice is headed to uh, bankruptcy. Pretty wild. Just a few years ago it was a 5.7 billion dollar company now it's headed into bankruptcy tom's got updates on that bunch of things with ron desantis how bad is it for ron desantis he's polling at rfk's level uh ron desantis could unlock an 86 million dollar presidential run bernie sanders recently calls for confiscation of wealth for people above 999 million dollars and trump imitates biden which we should play that clip here in a minute when we get into it and last but not least sanders said biden could win in a landslide. But before we do that, let's talk about something important here, such as parking violations in New York City. Wow. So New York City Council introduces bill requiring richer people to pay more for violations like parking tickets, double parking than the average person. Meaning if you make more money, you pay more. And California is doing a similar thing as well there. Let me read this story. So this this kind of, this to me is strange to just think about it. Say, hey, how much money you make last year? Well, listen, your ticket's going to be $600 instead of $300. What a wild situation in New York. So here we go. A new bill proposed by New York City Council would introduce a pilot program to scale civil fines, such as parking tickets, based on a person's income. Making richer people pay more for these fines. Proponents of the bill argue that scaling the fees uh, would encourage more people to pay and ensure that the penalties are fair and proportionate to person's ability to pay. The Independent Budget for, uh, Office found that New York City is owed more than $2 billion in unpaid fines from just the last five years. The bill has to survive a hearing in the council to be reviewed by Mayor Eric Adams once it's introduced. Similar programs exist in a handful of cities around the country and in Europe where technology is used to look up taxpayers' income to calculate fines. And by the way, California is doing a similar thing, propose, propose, proposing 
charging customers based on how much money they make when it comes down to their electrical bill. So if you make 180 or more, you could pay $85 or more for your electricity. Tom, what are your thoughts on this story? Uh, uh, folks, <laughs> when you hear when you hear them talking about Social Security and you hear the following words, means test. So when you see the riots that were going on in France, or 10 years ago, they had a thing called austerity, which was riots about people had were told they'd be retiring at a later age. Before they get their government pension, the pension would be smaller. We don't have to be economists to remember all that happened 10 years ago in Greece, and it's happening right now in France. And you'll hear Social Security means test. Means if you have the means to pay, you're going to get less Social Security, or you're going to have to pay more for Medicare services. So that has been the kernel, the seed that is behind this. And now this is just expanding. And by the way, the reason we're doing this is because our government is, we can say, broke. And we keep raising the debt limit, which is nothing more than raising the credit card limit on the United States of America. America to from, from unpayable to damn unpayable. And so what New York is doing is just picking up the same thing. They say, hey, the United States is broke. And some of you, when you are old enough to get Social Security, if you can afford to pay for other things, you're going to pay for them. And you're not going to give you the Social Security because we're broke and we're going to give it to the middle class and these and, and, and people with lesser capabilities. But you people that are wealthy, there'll be a means test. You have the means to pay then you don't get Social Security or Medicare cost you more. And now they're bringing it over to parking tickets saying, hey, wait, you know, we got all this, uh, we have all this technology. What if we find out the guy, hey, he's a $400,000 a year banker and he parked his Mercedes S-Class here and the meter ran out. Maybe that should be $100 for him, not $25. And that's what they're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to socialism. Can I, can I ask you a question, though? So, okay. So liberals argument. I'll give you the other side of the argument. You ready? Well, who came up with progressive? You're wrong. Who came up with? I'm pro- sorry, I jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, ca- who came up with progressive taxes? Who came up with progressive taxes? Which president? Which president? Who was big on we should we should tax? You know, well, Ronald Reagan even said we should tax. You mm-hmm. know, have progressive tax and we should do this and we should do that. So even your own president was for prog- progressive tax. Your your god of presidents, Ronald Reagan, proposed this. Why shouldn't we have progressive tax when it comes down to parking fees, electrical bills, all these other things? What do you say to that argument? Well, I didn't support that policy by Ronald Reagan, Beautiful. so okay. I think the response is that that was wrong. You know, conservatives have made mistakes many times. You have to be willing to call out your own side. I mean, this is this is just standard. People penalization of wealth. I don't understand why anyone who's successful would live in a place like New York. I cannot imagine why someone like you, for example, who's been wildly successful in business and made a bunch of money. I can't imagine why, unless you had to, for some business reason. You know, I lived in New York City for a long time because I worked, you know, in media. You had to be there. It was horrible. But why would someone elect to live in a place that outright comes front and center and penalizes you for wealth, penalizes you for success, says there's a separate set of standards for you? The reason they're doing this is because there's boatloads of people that you know you open up their glove compartment in their car and all that comes out are just parking tickets that have been unpaid and most of those people are lower income and you know what they say they say well they're not going to come for me because there's this sense in places like new york city that they won't come for the so-called little guy but if you're making you know 400 500 600 thousand dollars a year you're successful oh how dare you so it's just to me standard wealth penalization in in in, in woke, you know, progressive, which are, you know, basically regressive bastions. Let me let me go to the next one, which kind of goes with this. Bernie Sanders calls for confiscation of wealth <laughs> uh, ab- above 999. Do you have this clip, uh, Rob? While you're pulling up this Not clip, it's on Twitter. Leave millionaires <clears throat> alone. If you, if Not ta- millionaires. If you go on Twitter and it type like- in Sanders and Wallace, you'll show. Just type it on the Twitter, Sanders, Wallace, and that clip will show up. I'll read the story while you're looking for it. Because, you know, to stay on this messaging for as long as you have and people are listening to it, uh, do me a favor, type in Wallace and Sanders and then go to videos. It should be the first thing that pops up. If you go a little lower, right there, there. click on that one, make it bigger and play it. Beautiful. You're saying that billionaires should not exist. So are you basically saying that once you get to 999 million dollars that the government should confiscate all the rest i'm saying that we should go back to a very progressive tax policy like what we had under dwight d which would mean that that uh, after over yeah. a billion dollars, basically, yeah. it all goes to the government. I, you may disagree with me, mm-hmm. but just, just, all of it goes to the government. Yeah, I think people can make it on nine hundred, you know, ninety nine 
a million dollars. You're, you're saying, saying and you, you know he doesn't say though. So your money, you're at nine hundred ninety nine million, right? But now you're inve- Now you get the rest is gone. But now you're investing, and that money every single time it drips over, they're just gonna keep taking your money. Is yeah, that what this moron? But, but here's the thing. Okay, if the government could show that when the money is given to you, you pay off your debt, you're in a better financial position, and you make better investments that grow the GDP at a faster pace than the private market can do, well, then you have an argument. But you have a horrible resume <laughs> of this, you know, give the money above $200, uh, a billion dollars to the U.S. government. Here's what he says. He announced the support for President Joe Biden and called for a return to a very progressive tax policy that was like, that was under Dwight Eisenhower. He introduced new legislation in April, called for the 99 0.9% act, which calls for wealthy heirs to pay more on their inheritance by expanding the estate tax to 45% on a state's worth at least three and a half million dollars. It would also impose a 65% tax on billionaires tax on a state's worth a billion, 65%. Parents worked uh, hard for this money, and now the government's going to say, no, no, we did more for you to make this money than you did give that money to us. Tom, what are your thoughts on this argument with Bernie Sanders? Because it goes to me similar to what New York and California wants to do. Well, I look at it this way. I don't see an argument. What I see, I, I really, I don't see an argument. You have to understand where Bernie's coming from. Bernie is not trying to argue about changing percentages and things in the structure of the current, the current country. They want a restructuring of the company into a a socialist socialist construct supported by Marxist themes. That's what they want. They want to wholesale change the country. So when you look at it and you, you and you sit inside of a a democratic capitalist, you know, a freedom and liberty construct it, and these people say this to you, you say you people are insane. Well, they are insane in that argument. They're not insane when they look at their argument and their argument is a look, they're trying to convert this to a socialist construct. They don't care about the debt. They want the debt to crash the system. They want the outcome of that. There's no argument here that I see. What I see is them slowly pulling the rug out from under the, the, the construct of the country as we know it to get to their socialist paradigm supported by Marxist themes. That's what I see. That's the fundamental transformation of America that when you heard Barack Obama talking about in 2008 and people had a really hard time visualizing what that was, this is it. And I think, you know, <laughs> these people want mediocrity. They want, you know, they want that and they want people who've Which done better dependency. than that. That's correct. Mediocrity breeds dependency on the institutions they love, by the way. A lot of these Democrats are very big pharma allies. allies. It, it, it just it also encourages people who have been successful to want to do what? Pick up and leave. There's so many successful people now that don't even want to be in the United States anymore. Yep. They're like, where can I go? Because they see that this is seeping through and seeping through. My two messages to Bernie. One is it's not up to you. This is not your money. Somebody else has earned this money. It's not up to you to decide if a million is too much or 10 million is too much or or, or a billion is too much. It's not your money. Hands off people's money. It's mm-hmm. not up to you. And secondly, Pat, you made a great point about, you know, what the government does completely inefficiently with that money. You can't trust yeah. that your money is <laughs> going to be used well. And a lot of times these wealthy people will donate to charity, will do so much better with their money than handing it over to government bureaucracy that does what? Throws money at education? No. No results. Throws money at the military. No results. Throws money. Where? What has the government government done well? If you can delineate for me what the government has done well with your money, then you have an argument. I'll wait. There's no. And by the way, here's the same guy that used to criticize millionaires and billionaires, millionaires and billionaires, billionaires, millionaires and billionaires. Hey, Bernie, you're a millionaire. All right, billionaires and billionaires, <laughs> right, and billionaires right. and billionaires. Yeah. And billionaires. Right. yeah. Stand by for a yeah, quick how, edit. Like, yeah, yeah, Pat, like, how would you feel, Pat? You're, I mean, successful, like Jet said. You're hitting that billion and all that money. You have no idea where it's going. And then you nailed it, Jed. They're going to send it to Ukraine. They're going to send it to places where there's war and shit like that. And it's just like you don't have the money to even open your mouth. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. By the right? way, Jed said something <clears throat> very important. You have no right on what a person wants to do with their money. Mm-hmm. Stop trying to make decisions thinking it's your money and it's your children. Those two things. Leave the children alone. Mm-hmm. 
and leave their money alone. Both are theirs. They've paid a price for it, not you. But that's uh, the core argument. The core argument is the children are the children of the state under the socialist construct. Yeah. They are there, and you didn't earn that. There is a structure around you, and they argue energy, infrastructure, sewage, all these things, electricity. That was there, and your success was based on that, so you really don't deserve all this. And it goes back to Barack Obama. You didn't build that. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't build that by yourself. All right, let's go to a business story, and then we'll get into a couple stories here uh, with what's going on with Tucker. So First Republic is taken over by FDIC and sold to J.P. Morgan, a third major bank failure in 2023. By the way, last week's story came out. Their shares dropped 43%, 43%. But there's a company that's capitalizing off of this, and that company's name is... J.P. Morgan. So First Republic Bank has been taken over by federal regulators and will be sold to J.P. Morgan, making it the third major bank to go under in less than two months within with $229 billion in total assets. At the time of closure, First Republic Bank has become the second largest bank failure in American history, 90 days apart, by the way, losing about 40% of its deposit in the first quarter of the year amid rising interest rates and after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank earlier this year, causing a growing cohort of depositors to move their money to banks seen as safer and offering more attractive returns. As of mid-March, about 70% of First Republic deposits were uninsured. That's that's a big number, meaning they were larger than $250,000 guaranteed limit. The FDIC estimates the cost of First Republic receivership will be about $13 billion, less than the $20 billion that is estimated at the cost of Silicon Valley Bank. First Republic's 84 branches in eight states will reopen Monday as branches of J.P. Morgan Chase. Tom. Well, you know, some of you may walk down the street in quaint little towns and you'll notice a garage sale and you go up, maybe buy a trinket, get lucky, find an old baseball card there. Uh, Jamie Diamond on the weekend walks down the street and buys banks. And this is Chase. <laughs> this is Ch- hey, there's First Republic. <laughs> Do you take a check? Um, the And what is happening here is the consolidation of 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 the banking industry, because ever since 2008, the last crisis, things have become more and more lax. You know, you've had a variety of things that have uh, Glass-Steagall and other things that were designed to help it, but now you have banks failing, except the FDIC, think of that as the deductible. Like when your car crashes, you $500 deductible at the body shop, and then the other guy that crashed into you, hopefully their insurance pays the rest. Well, the FDIC, the little sticker on the window that says $250,000 deposit, think of that as the deductible. But now Jan and Yellen, when SVB crashed, they created that new vehicle that the banks can get their hands on, which protects $250,000 and up. So it basically goes like this. It, it promotes irresponsibility mm-hmm. because now the banks can be very re- irresponsible because FDIC will get part. Janet Yellen and Treasury will get the other part, and then the bank will get bought because there's loans in there. There's car loans, home loans with good people and things, and J.P. Morgan says, I'll take those loans over here, I'll collect the interest on them, and I'll help you out. And so what is happening is a consolidation of banking, and then unstable banks are are failing. Um, this is also is very interesting, is SVB and um, First Republic, J.P. Morgan, specifically Jamie Dimon, is trying to walk back into Silicon Valley to have a foothold there. Remember, it was 2016 that he was the first of the big banks, and he came out in an annual banking letter, and he said, listen, Silicon Valley is coming. They're smart. They're clever. They're going to take away consumer pain points, and they're not going away, and they don't take prisoners. So he was warning the traditional banking industry of basically the looming fintech. And he's trying to come back in and make himself... um, you know, relevant, make J.P. Morgan relevant. Three years later, he says, oh, you know, um, I just want to let you know, Chase is not a tourist. We're not just visiting. This is not a lecture tour that we're doing here in Silicon Valley. We're here and we want to do things. And so you're, you're basically seeing Chase saying it wants to be the biggest, and they're, they're not— I even, respect that. I respect I do that. Too. Listen, Sandy Wall uh, had a chance when the whole story went— you know, uh, Jamie Dimon used to work for Sandy Wall. Sandy told Jamie, do whatever you want to do, run the company. The first thing is, uh, Jamie Dimon does is fires his daughter. Nah. <laughs> it's a Pretty very gangster. wild story. And then the wife says, what are you doing? You let I didn't this say guy that. fire your daughter. He <laughs> says, you can't fire my daughter. He says, you told me to run the company. He used to be a city guy. So everybody knows in that world, if you're going to talk about the Michael, the Kobe of this era, Jamie's the guy. And he's not slowing down. 
And he's going to be a guy that when you're thinking about someone's going to be a you know company to buy, everybody points at Jamie. So he's done a great job. you got to give him credit. But the question now becomes, quietly, as much as they want to downplay this, how many people are now sitting there saying, listen, man, I'm not waiting anymore. We're part of a regional. We're part of a community. We're leaving. Just go to one of the big five. This is two in 90 days or 120 days. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about like $20 billion bank or 40. These are two $200 billion banks we're talking about. Two hundred. You know how big $200 billion is? If you were to look at some of the companies that we all know about, Starbucks size. If you go to you know Coca-Cola, if some of these come, how big are these companies? These are $200 billion companies. Mm-hmm. There, there's not that many $200 billion companies that we're talking about. Tom. Who's next based on this? Who are they talking about? I've heard a couple different names. I'm curious to know who you're hearing about being possible. I wish next. I had the whole list in front of me, but it's basically there's a variety of lists out there, and there's some ones that are right at the top that are stretched on, on the loans they made and the things that they invested in. They invested some bonds, which are now have moved on the interest rate, meaning, picture it this way, banks bought... I'll put it this way for gold, for the average person to understand. They bought gold high, now gold's low, and they're have, having trouble selling the gold, and that's supposed to offset the loans they have. So it's like, whoops, you now can't sell the gold to pay off all, all your loans or to cover all your loans. What's very, very, there's another very, very interesting thing that's going on in the middle of this is what you just said, Pat. Goldman came out, and they had a crappy earnings quarter, but... They had a whole bunch more deposits. Now, where did that come from? Of course. Schwab came out and had actually a solid quarter, but they got a bunch more deposits. And Schwab was saying, you know, we were very surprised. Schwab has a money fund that's right around 4%, and that's fairly low risk. Like the lowest risk you can get is like a standard money fund. 4% may not seem like a lot until until you think back that Ma and Pa have been looking at interest rates of half a percent, 1%, or nothing. And all of a sudden... Money's being moved to money markets right now. Money's being made to movie markets say, hey, mom, ma and pa talk about it. They say, well, at least we can get 4% and we're not exposed to this zaniness going on in the yeah. stock market. So so here, here's what's crazy. But the big guys are getting the deposits. Here's what's crazy. You know, uh, the, the one conversation that's coming up is a lot about the dollar collapsing. And and people are fearing, could this happen, you know, since 1450? Can you guess how many different currencies we've had since 1450? How many different world reserve currencies have we had since 1450? Can you name them, Tom? I'm curious enough if you know about this or not. Oh, wow. We have well, a video that's coming up on this specifically well, the, next week. Well, the U.S. dollar is only since late 40s. It was a huge surge <clears> after <throat> World War II, and it became the world reserve. And I think before that, you had Great Britain Pound. Okay, you got that one. And then um, at one point, didn't you have the gold back Spanish real, the kings and queens? That's prior. So it's Portugal, it's Spain, it's Netherlands, then France, then Great Britain, then it's... U.S. And U.S. is, some say, since yep. 1921, but it's really 45. So the concern is, is it time for this? Because it lasts about 80 to 100 years. That's about the timeline. And we've been around that number right now at about 78 years, 1945. We're about 80 years right now. So here's what it's leading to. People ask, what should I do? You should consider investing into non-duplicatable assets, such as what? Alternative investments. Masterworks are sponsored today. Something you ought to consider doing. Art had a record-breaking year last year in 2022 with all the fears. The top three auction houses had a record-breaking year of $18 billion last year. Art alone went up last year on an average of 29%. And it's been said the last time inflation was this high, contemporary art appreciated on an average of 20% per year from MW Index. This is something you ought to consider. Everything they do at Masterworks is qualified with the SEC and broken into shares, meaning if you want to buy a Banksy, a Picasso, any of these uh, things that may be Warhol, you say, I can't afford to buy a $2 million piece, we can buy a share of it at Masterworks. I think they have over 700,000 users now working with them. If you do want to be invited and join an exclusive community. Rob, let's put the link below for people to find. At Masterworks, you will find a link both in the chat and the description about Masterworks. This Have- is really great because you can <clears throat> invest in a Picasso, and Picasso hasn't made a new painting in years. Yeah, he hasn't made it for that, years. That, I don't yeah. know why he stopped after he, he died. Like he stopped painting himself. himself. I, can totally, <laughs> I don't know why that happens I, I can, sometimes. I, I can totally see somebody using that like as as like a bragging tool. Like, hey, you know the uh, Mona Lisa, and they're like, you own no, no, you know that red velvet rope that they have. <laughs> I own that bright buckle, and they're like, ah, come it. on. Okay, so story came out, Jed. How bad is it for DeSantis? He's polling 
at RFK's level. This is a CNN story that just came out. And uh, 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 Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has been trying to appeal to his party's conservative base with moves such as signing a six-week abortion ban and fighting with Disney, but his efforts have not paid off in primary Republican polling. A recent Fox News poll shows him at 21 percent, 32 points behind President Donald Trump, and comparable with 19 percent that Robert F. Kennedy uh, is receiving from the Democratic side. Candidates polling in the low 20s, like DeSantis, have gone on to win with about 20 percent of the time. DeSantis' decline is at least in part because of Trump's rise, who has gone from the low to mid-40s to above 50 percent in the average 2024 polling. DeSantis plays to the right, doesn't line up with where the anti-Trump forces are within the Republican Party, which includes a moderate wing that is least likely to want a ban on abortion after six weeks. By the way, this is a Fox News poll, and we all know Fox is no longer Trump's camp. They mm-hmm. want DeSantis. So what are your thoughts on the story? You know, I I do think he's in trouble. I don't know. You know, when you watch his delivery sometimes, I mean, he's he's a great governor. I think we can all acknowledge that. And and rational people will see what he's done in Florida. And policy-wise, I think he's on point. But I don't think this is about, oh, he's not, you know, moderate enough. There's something about DeSantis's delivery, I think, that is going to have a hard time translating to the national stage. I think if you have, if you stuck him on a stage today and you put him and you put someone like a Donald Trump, I think Donald Trump destroys him absolutely destroys him. And that's not because of policy, by the way. I think, you know, Trump has the, uh, he may step into some potholes here and there when he talks about, you know, the uh, vaccine. He may stop into, he's going to get himself into trouble when he talks about policy. And he's also going to be part of a legacy that people may reject. He also has the January 6th stuff. There's a lot of baggage that he has, but there's something about his ability to captivate an audience, about his charisma, about his capacity to own that stage that DeSantis doesn't quite have. Mm -hmm. There's something missing there. Now, also, you have this rift right now in the Republican Party. I don't know that the Trump voters who are really passionate about Trump, I don't know if all of those go over to DeSantis. I don't think that the DeSantis voters necessarily go over to Trump. So I think this rift is going to be an issue. I think we're going to need to, if Republicans want to win, we're going to have to decide, first of all, you know, is there an official run here from DeSantis? What does that look like? Also, all of this travel that he's doing, you know, this like world tour that he did where he's everywhere, but there's no official announcement. I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. People don't understand what his strategy is. Is your strategy to be this fantastic, incredible governor in Florida with a great record? Is your strategy to move on to the national stage? And I don't think people know what to do with all of this chaos right now. Because if DeSantis moves out of the way and says, I'm not doing it, then I think things look very different for Trump. If DeSantis is in the game, then people have to start thinking about this differently. I I, I don't know what's going to happen here, but he is missing something. Like he's missing that star power that you don't necessarily need as a governor, but you do need on that national stage. You really do. It makes a huge difference. Uh, you, and you know, you know why you need it? I know you want to say something, Tom. You know why you need it? Here's why you need it. So you don't need it all the time. I mean, Biden's got zero star power. That's you, different. You, 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 but that's what I'm saying to you. Mm-hmm. But Biden has zero star power, right? I think Sanders has star power, right? If you think about Bernie Sanders, forget about his policies. Oh, yeah. It's ludicrous, but he's got star power, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Obama, star power. Oh, yeah. Okay. Clinton, star power, right? You, you look at John Kerry, no star power, right? John F. Kennedy, star power. Nixon, no star power. You can go back and say, well, that's not necessarily true in the history of all this other stuff. The problem he's facing. The guy that's part of his party that's leading right now has been a star before he was born. Yeah. Because his mom and his dad were stars and that, you know, they were in the parties. They were all. So he's grown up. And and in a way, it's unfair to DeSantis because DeSantis has not been in the, you know, limelight, Hollywood, you know, stars, parties, networking, charm, charisma, selling, all this stuff. He's been more to doer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the job done. But now when the camera lights, everything is on action, you kind of got to show up. You know, and the way it happened with his books, there was not a lot of performance there, Tom. Jed, I want to dig in a little bit on on what you just said, because it's it's very interesting. You were saying that thing. And I've always I've sat back and I've always believed that Bill Clinton could have uh, carried the day on any other president or candidate, including Obama. I think actually he would have been more tenaciously, factually, a stronger debate with with Obama. And the American 
uh, voter right now kind of is short attention span theater. I think we could probably agree on that. And they're easily impressionable. It, DeSantis doesn't have that that charisma there that um, that Trump does, the stage presence. So what do you think happens over the course of the summer? You know, we've got a tough economy. Does short attention span theater carry the day on the GOP side? Or do people back up and start thinking maybe a little bit more rationally about economics and start looking at DeSantis' record? I, I don't have a bias here. I actually don't have an opinion yet. I'm kind of watching like everybody else. But you dig into it. What do you think? No, I, I don't think that that need for the entertainer ever goes away. And I always said this. If you're not entertaining people, they're not listening. So you can be a doer. and You can be incredibly efficient. And, and Ron DeSantis is. You know, he's that guy that you hire if you want to get stuff done, mm -hmm. right? That's great. But he's not the guy you hire if you want to convince people to vote for him to get that stuff done. So it, it's, I mean, could, and the other option is, you know, does this become a team? I don't know. They've been taking, you know, Trump's been taking a lot of jabs at DeSantis, but truly, if you paired them, then you have the efficiency of a Ron DeSantis, you have the record of a Ron DeSantis, and you have the powerhouse personality of a Donald Trump. <clears throat> That's a very interesting ticket to me. You mean President VP? Yeah. You know very what, you know what Giuliani said it can't happen because they're both residents of Florida. Oh, so yeah, by that's law, right. you can't do that that's right. because they're both from Florida. But that's what you need. So, yeah. like, if, say, it's Trump, he needs to be looking for someone. He doesn't need that big personality. He needs somebody who is a doer in the He's same the way that Ron guy. DeSantis oh, yeah. doesn't need oh, a doer. He the needs guy. the personality. Yeah. So that's the complementary structure that works. GOP <sighs> voters will not just push to the side and say, oh, the economies, let me vote based on issues. Let me get practical right now. That actually goes very much against most people's human nature. They want someone who they're going to want to sit and hang out with. And right now, Ron DeSantis is reading a little bit too much like a politician mm -hmm. or a businessman. He needs to read more like someone that you'd want to have a beer with. That's just a reality. You don't have to like that reality, but it is when it get, yeah. what, what gets that's somebody elected. Not with Biden. Now, let me just address Biden for a second, though, because you said, first of all, it's very different with Democrats. Everyone, media at large, Hollywood at large, mm. everyone rushes in to help Democrats. <clears throat> they actually have to be less entertaining <clears throat> and bring a lot less to the table because they have so much in their favor, but Biden used to be a funny guy. Yeah, I interviewed him on the set of The View. We had him on. He was funny. He was likable. I walked away. He whispered in my ear, hey, don't tell anyone, but I'm a big fan. You know, <laughs> we, we had a great discussion. He was very charismatic, yeah. but that, and he was that guy, right? He knew what to say, this, did that. Did you get, yeah. get a little grab there, too? No, he, he didn't, definitely, thankfully. He, he, he definitely didn't sniffed approach. your hair. Although there is a picture. <laughs> did he smell your he hair? He smelled yeah. your hair 100%. There's a picture out there of him, like, leaning in, and I'm like, this. <laughs> And everybody oh, did yeah. memes on that. So funny. But he had a person. You know, he's yeah. just, he's not present anymore. Yeah, but gone. he doesn't uh -huh. need to be. Republicans need to be everything and more yeah. right now to get yeah. elected. But, you know, I think it is, uh, Jen, you were, ta uh, Jen, you were talking about that missing thing. Trump is a, vet he's not a veteran in military like DeSantis is, but he's a veteran of the media and the right. gut. Everybody, that, that swamp that he was talking about, he, st he stood in the front lines. He fought these people. He won. They cheated on him. They, he still got there. Look at all the shit no, that no, they've he's done. He's a patriotic yeah. he's, oh, he's a gangster. Bro. Look and at those Thanksgivings where he showed up around the world at oh, places. I got to say something. Those boys <laughs> loved him. He is a boss. He is a leader. But, but the scary thing is, Jed, that look what they're doing. They did all this investigation, all this whatever. Now Trump is number one. DeSantis is barely hanging on. The left, we have to ask ourselves a question why is the left so uh, wanting trump in there because they, they think that they could get his ass out so, so, yeah, they could that's beat right. that's what so, so he, here's here's a uh, uh, so blue ocean strategy we just interviewed the authors for two hours and we had a very interesting conversation about esg dei if you guys know about that book i've probably sold a hundred thousand copies of that book i love that book if you've never read it you got to read it it's the number one or number two best marketing book in the history of business books uh, behind tied with Michael Porter, Competitive Strategy, and Top 10 Best Business Books of All Time. The book sold five and a half million copies. Incredible book. They got a new book coming out called Beyond Disruption. It's a great conversation. Everything in life, you have to look at yourself as a product, your company, your country. Anything you do is a blue ocean concept. So what can I compete? To? Like if you're trying to date a girl and you're going up against Larry, okay, and if Larry comes from a rich family and this guy's family is rich and he's the quarterback and he's the guy, the jock, all this other stuff, but he's really dumb, okay, but he's extremely handsome. However, from your end, you're a competitive swimmer and you have this and your background is rugged and you're coming from streets and you're kind of like this. 
You can't go and try to compete with him in an area that he's got you beat. You're not going to win, bro. You're just not going to win, okay, in the Blue Ocean concept. Okay, if we look at America against other countries, so other countries' argument could be like in Iran. I'll never forget when I'm sitting with my mom, and my mom was supportive of Khomeini because the fear they had is look what Iran's losing. It's losing its conservative values. Women are out there wearing this, and they're no longer wearing scarves, and they're becoming hookers. And they're... Literally, women in Iran were afraid that by giving too much freedom to women, uh, their daughters could one day end up becoming street girls, all this other stuff. So that was how it was sold. Mm. But Iran realized you can't sell to a woman of Iran. You can be free. You can do what you want to do. You can do this. No, we have to give our argument that's different than Iran, than U.S., because if we talk about freedom, you're going to lose to U.S., 100%. right? Let's do DeSantis against everybody else here right now, okay? Charisma, you're going to lose. Charm, you will lose, okay? Uh, policies, you will win, Okay. Uh, uh, leadership and doing it during COVID when it was so nasty. You won't win. You will dominate, okay? When it comes down to getting into a fight, can you stand up? Yes. Uh, when you do interviews and you, somebody's not in your ear trying to make you look perfect and you're just yourself and you're the tough guy that's going out there and pushing, challenging, all that stuff, that's a turn on. And you're like, here's what I stand for. I think if a marketer sits down and says, dude, Blue Ocean Strategy, you're not going to beat them in this game. Ruby and Cruz tried, and they got destroyed. So don't try to play that game. But if there's one thing about DeSantis, if he goes and they push him and he fights, he's in more you know, opportunities to debate somebody, opportunities where to have a banter with somebody on TV, going on CNN, going on MSNBC, and they're pushing him, and he comes back and says, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? I think he wins there because I think naturally he is a street brawler, mm -hmm. but I feel like he's being held back from brawling. I think that is something that is a strength. I think someone in his ears not letting brawl. I out think there. he's guarded. He's very guarded, but he has a likability problem. Like if you think about, I mean, you talked about Rubio and Cruz. Rubio and Cruz are not likable. Like no. I don't want to hang out with either of them. You know, I, I don't. And I think a lot of people would probably find themselves saying the same thing. Mm. Not that you don't want them to run something, but again, I'm talking yeah. about likability. Can you imagine Ron DeSantis excelling the way Trump does? When Trump does it, do, goes to a small town and he walks into the pizzeria oh. and he's like, "Hey, everyone!" and he has the pizzeria, he has the bite of the McDonald's hamburger or whatever that is, he shines. He is a man of the people well, in those compare, moments. You can compare DeSantis to that. He has no. to be able to do that, though. DeSantis has to be able to well, do don't that. Think at that do, level. do you think his marketing He's not going to win an election if he can't appeal to people in a way that resonates with so, them. For example, if they don't do you, like him, do they're remember, not voting for him. Do you remember him. the Dukaka story? Where he came on the tank. Do you know that whole story? Oh my god. Where gosh. after that it was do you know the story with Dukakis and the tank? No. Uh, Rob, do you know the story or no? Just type Dukakis and tank. This is when he was over with. Tom, do you want to tell us what the story's about? So Michael Dukakis has to look like, you know, a little <laughs> bit of a little bit of all America. I'm gonna be a commander in chief and I'm just a governor up here, and they're criticizing me for being a brainy little governor. So what he did was he went out riding around in this tank, taking a tour of a military facility. Funny. And Bush, remember, this is Bush Sr., Herbert Walker Bush. Bush looks at that and they're like, Oh, this guy's we, this thank you. Thank you, Jesus. He's destroyed. Thank you for this, <laughs> this picture and everything. And he came out, he was destroyed because, number one, he didn't look presidential. Number two, he didn't look like a commander in chief. He looked like a geek. And, and he, had he had let Willie Horton out of jail only to commit another crime. And so his back was up against the wall. And it's basically. Tom, he looks like he's from the Middle East. Yeah, he, dude, that looks like a Taliban guy. Just... No, you know, he looks like he's in a high school. He looks like he's my second cousin or something, like we're related. He's in a high school play about Vietnam <laughs> Dude, is what this is. But here's the point I'm trying to make. To you. I, I'm, I'm trying to make a point about what Jed is saying. Here's here's the point. Okay, where can DeSantis excel if he does videos and clips and things like that? Hang out with Navy SEALs. Go exactly. to the military because guess what? They know you. Go hang out with Navy SEALs. We all respect SEALs. You were a commander of Navy SEAL team. Go around Navy SEALs. What do we think about when we think about SEAL Team 6? What do I think about when we think about Navy SEALs? Imagine he's going out there sitting there Killers. with 20 other Navy SEALs yeah. that respect him. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the great work that they do. All of a sudden, we're like, oh, my God, this guy's a Navy SEAL. Look, He was a commander. He wasn't a Navy SEAL, but he was yeah. a commander of a Navy SEAL team. There is things that he, you know, others cannot do that. You were not a Navy. You were not in the military. So you don't understand. I think the positioning for him, if he goes direct, to what Trump naturally has been doing in New York. Yep. 
and nationwide, I think he's going to get destroyed. Pat, is what Pat does, does he have to hire a team? Like Pat, because you talked about this on the Giuliani thing, about his marketing team, how they weren't doing a great job, especially with the book. I'm making a phone call to Blue Ocean Do, Strategy Consultants, go, and I'm see, hiring them low-key. Go with that Pat, question. Go with that line. I know where yeah. you're going. I want to follow up. Go. Yeah, yeah. So basically what I'm saying is, like, Pat, Pat, you're right now, DeSantis, yeah. I got the Navy SEAL thing thing, but are you going as of right now, Pat? Are you just getting aggressive and going out there? Because, yo, he has to work out that muscle, Pat. That... DeSantis has a little bit of it because I think he got that from Trump. He kind of he kind of takes his his cues on like how he you know, he talks to the media, but he hasn't had that really fight that that big argument with any media outlet where you're like, oh shit, this guy he's good. Like go ahead, go ahead. Tom. So here, here, here's something that I saw. Um, the people that have been at school and served and mm -hmm. knew DeSantis from Yale and from his time as a JAG, yeah. which was Judge Advocate General in in the Navy, all said the same thing. That, that get in an argument with this guy or get in a debate with this guy. Let, let me correct this first. Yeah. And he comes uh, DeSantis out. joined the United States Navy in 2000, promoted to a lieutenant before serving as a legal advisor to SEAL Team 1. Yes. Just, just want to put that out there so everybody yeah. knows. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, yeah. correct. He was a JAG. Yeah, so he was yeah. a lawyer. judge He's advocate, a which is a lawyer in the yeah. Navy, and he was working with SEAL Team 1. It says, you know, you can't prosecute these guys. The bad guys deserve to guy. So that's what he was basically doing for yeah. a while. Yeah. <laughs> but what he did, do you remember when he got in, when they, uh, he wasn't so packaged? Right now what you're seeing is political consultants and other people packaging the candidates. And I know Jed's got an opinion on mm. this and can amplify it. She's got more information than I do on this. But the consultants package candidates the same way you get packaged and produced when you're, you know, uh, uh, when you're on a, a show on TV. Do you remember during the debate, why is Florida open? What the hell are they doing down there? And they allowed some of the media to get close and ask unscripted questions. Do you remember what that governor with his rolled up sleeves from the podium was telling people? No, 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 no. You don't tell me. I'm leading this state, and this is what He's we're a doing. Leader. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. He's a leader. That, that yeah. was unscripted. They're trying to package That's what him, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the thing is, though, like what DeSantis is missing for me, and I'm, I, by the way, I'm a, I'm a fan of his policies. I am. But what he's missing is very hard to teach. It's very hard to teach. I would rather, if you had to hire me for that role, I would rather have to teach Trump how to change what he's doing because he's got stuff that's so hard to teach, that charisma. You can't teach it to Hillary Clinton. People on the Democrat oh. side have been trying to teach her how to be likable, oh. how to relate to people. <laughs> There's like a film over her. And, and what DeSantis needs to lose is this politician vibe. Mm -hmm. He doesn't read as like a non-politician. That's what Trump has. That's why he's considered a hero to people who believe in populism. I think it's going to be very hard. Is that to say that DeSantis can't overcome it? No, no. But it's going to be really challenging for him because I don't think it's natural for him. I don't think you can hire a media consultant. And by the way, most of the times the people that get hired by these politicians are people who don't know how to do media. I'm always like, I'm like, just hire somebody who understands this game, who yep. gets charisma. <clears throat> they never hire those people. But even if you hired somebody, I think it's going to be really hard to push DeSantis he reads, like you said, he's a lawyer for the SEALs. He reads like the lawyer. He doesn't have that blue collar yeah. vibe. And that's really what most of America is, yeah. right? We're really just regular people. I grew up behind the Staten Island dump. Like, I want to feel yeah. like somebody gets my struggle. And yep. he's too polished. If he can lose that, I think he can climb. And I, I, don't, I don't think I in a year, I don't think in a year, Tom, he, that, that could, that, that's just my personal opinion. But let's not forget, we live in Florida now, right? We came here because we heard this guy speaking and, DeSantis is Florida famous. Yeah. Trump is international, bro. Everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows the attitude. I don't think I don't think a year is going to be know, enough. I, for him I think a lot of Leave people him alone think, and let him be who he is. Let America yeah. see the you package said, you you're said, get. You said Hillary. <laughs> you know, I love on, on what Hillary did. You know who destroyed Hillary uh, Clinton's campaign? It was game over the day she went on the Zach Galifianakis show. It was done. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> Zach Between Galifianakis two Between two is responsible for Hillary Clinton never <laughs> becoming a president. It was on a dark Period. set. It was yeah. on a dark set. Between I'd two like firms, to go remember? to our sponsors. <laughs> there it was. Yeah, he goes, if, if I'm going to contact you, can I email you? <laughs> Funny or die, he oh. destroyed her campaign. By the way, just something on DeSantis before we yeah. wrap up. He's got $86 million waiting for him. Florida wow. Governor Ron DeSantis, if he... Plans to enter the Republican prim uh, pr presidential primary using an $86 million pot of donor money in a legally 
questionable way. This is a, a WSJ story, Wall Street Journal story. If he goes there, he has potentially access to this. That's a good amount of money, but Jeb Bush started with $140 million day one, and he's not Also the president. not teachable, yeah. by the way. Jeb Bush, no one's I think, I think those exactly. are very two different people. That's true. I think those are very, very two true. different people. Look, can you imagine if he can't announce anything yet until – he locks in his governor's seat position, which I think he has to wait a week or something like that to make an announcement. Imagine him it's having to listen to right? it, it, he has to listen to all of this commentary on social, on news, and it's he's sitting there saying, I'm gonna kill you guys the moment I can <laughs> right, come out. He's gonna come out, he's gonna be like, Thank God this thing is off. <laughs> Let me talk. I'm running. Here's what we're doing. We, I mean, hopefully he and comes you know out what? like that. Maybe but. something shows up when he yeah, does that. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Maybe. If it does, listen, Maybe. we all like too. a good fight. We'll see what happens. So uh, real estate, Tom, real quick, uh, uh, real estate story uh, in regards to what happened with mortgages. Home prices in March posted biggest annual decline in 11 years. Biggest annual decline in 11 years. Uh, it fell 2.4% in March to an annual rate of 4.4 million, uh, marking the 13th time in 14 months that sales have declined, according to... National Association of Realtors, the March drop follows February's uh, surprise rise of 13 and three quarters from the previous month. The slowdown in the housing market is now affecting prices, which fell 0.9% year on year to median existing home price of $375,000. Folks, there's nothing in Florida, uh, South Florida at three seventy five. This is places like Toledo. But the housing market is slowing down due to a rise of mortgage rates, high home prices, and low inventory levels. Housing starts, which measure... Uh, U.S. home building fell 0.8% in March from February, according to the Commerce Department. The number of new listings in March fell 20% year over year, while the inventory of home sales is uh, 1% higher than in February and up 5.4% year over year. The cooling housing market is caused by a cooling economy, the prospect of a recession within the year, the high inflation, which is being fueled by housing cost uh, uh, prices. Tom, while I'm uh, reading this story, what you know, Powell is getting ready to potentially do something with the rates. What do you know about what he's going to do? Is he going to raise rates? We're hearing mixed stories from a lot of different people. What do you expect going to happen? Well, um, if Kai will get the t shirt up for sale, we have the 2028. It says, Fight inflation, save the cheerleader. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's an. It, it's up there somewhere, Kai. You got to get it into the storefront on ValueTimit.com. What else, Tom? Go ahead. Keep going. So here's what's happening. Powell is coming up, I believe, in the next. He's heading up the stairs right now because the Fed is meeting right now, and there's going to be announcements in the next 24 hours, and then also a jobs report by uh, Friday, Cinco de Mayo, um, in which we're going to hear, I think, a quarter point increase, and then, but we're also going to hear him say that we believe we've turned the corner on things, and so there may not be further increases in June and in July, and maybe when we get toward the end of the year, probably November time frame, maybe we can see the first rate decrease. So that is what interest rates are looking like right now, that maybe we're um, right there on the edge of it. Now, what does all this stuff mean on the home prices? Well, that means that Interest rates are still high. People are reluctant to put their homes on the market. Right now, there's only 980,000 listings available in these United States. 980,000. That is the lowest it's been in years. And that's resulting in what it says is home sales have fallen to an average of 4.4 million a year. There's about 100 million sellable homes in America. So they're saying only about 4.4. Four million of those will trade hands. In a strong year, it's usually about 10 million trade hands, like one in 10. So what do we have right now? People that have put their houses on the market, mm -hmm. the price is still high, and they're reluctant to drop it because no buyers are approaching, so there's no reason to drop it. No other houses are on the market. There's no competition on their block. There's no reason to drop the price. So low inventory gives consumers few choices, and prices aren't dropping. And even if they could afford it, the interest rates on the mortgages are too high, meaning very few transactions happen, and that's what you're, they were talking about here is U.S. home sales fell. That's not home prices, folks. That's a number of transactions. So your friend who's a realtor, less work. Your friend who's a mortgage broker, less work. Working for a title company, anybody that's in uh, real estate has got uh, less work and having a tough time, but there's no recession here. But there's no recession. No. They changed the definition in real time. Remember that. 
So that that's what's going on, Pat. But we're going to see. I think uh, Jerome Powell is going to be, you know, walking back down those stairs out of breath on Wednesday afternoon after uh, giving the cheerleader one more shot. Yeah, and Tom, uh, Tom another do you think point. even even with all this stuff that's going on and his lack of concern for the cheerleader and <clears throat> with the numbers that they're seeing, Silicon Valley Bank, and then you know First Republic. How many people you think are calling him saying, dude, what are you doing? The more you raise the rates, there's more banks. We can't afford it. Like, how many people you think are trying to get that message across to him? Of course, we know who's not making that call. Who isn't making that call? Jamie Dimon ain't making that call. Jamie Dimon is making a call and saying, hey, Jerome, listen, if you want to raise the rates even more, go for it. I will totally support you. I understand. It's not fair what's Jerome, going on. Jerome, it's Jamie. Maybe as a precaution, take a half point this time. Just right. as a precaution. Right. But but he knows. You know you know who wins the more he increases the rates? The big banks. The oh, yeah. more he increases the rates, the more big banks win. The less he increases the rates, the less smaller banks win. So... Is, do you think people are making that call? Do you think the White House is making the calls? Do you think the, the chairman and CEOs of banks are calling and saying, hey, can you relay this message to Powell? Or do you think none of that is taking place right now? I think everybody is calling. There's about uh, there's a group of board of governors for the Fed that all vote on this, but Jay Powell is the leader. And I think you're correct. Everyone is calling him. And I think it's going to be a good Cinco de Mayo for one part. And this is what I, what I mean by it. I think the jobs report is not going to be catastrophic, but these layoffs are going to be very real. But I think Jay Powell is going to come out and say this quarter point, and I think we're at a moderation of inflation. I think maybe we have turned the corner, a a, a, a prudence of, uh, of a flat policy over the summer. If he says phrases like that, everybody's going to say, oh, the worst is over. And you're going to see a stock rally this week, I believe, and that ends on Cinco de Mayo. But... On Main Street, it isn't Cinco de Mayo yet. On Main Street, it's still layoffs, housing, as we've talked about. And yeah, Pat, I think there's many sectors that are out there that wish. Look, if he wants to, if he wants to really, okay, we'll use another word here. If he really wants to goose the economy, um, then all he does is he drops things two points tomorrow morning and makes cheap money out there. He won't there. do it. He shouldn't. He's do not. It. But I don't he, think that's the right move. I think history is going to be kind to Jay Powell that he was able to tame inflation without cataclysmic unemployment. But I think there is going to be a bit of a recession. People are saying 89% chance. You got the Wall Street bankers today, 86% chance on a wide survey of Wall Street uh, bankers and analysts saying we're going to have a recession. Probably Q4, Q1 is what people are, are now pointing to. That's all part of getting through the inflation and getting back to a so strong here's economy. what here's what Berkshire's Charlie Munger just said. He issued warning for U.S. commercial property. Uh, 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 Charlie Munger has issued a warning about the U.S. commercial property market, saying that the banks are full of bad loans as property prices fall. Munger noted that banks were already pulling back from lending to commercial developers and that there are a lot of trouble office buildings and shopping centers, saying there's a lot of agony out there. Munger also said that the Berkshire Hathaway had supported troubled U.S. banks in the past and that it is not that damn easy to run a bank intelligently. There are a lot of temptations to do the wrong thing, which a lot of people have done that. There's a $300 million building story that was going out there in San Francisco. If you can pull up the picture here, uh, for, uh, it's a fire sale, $300 million building in San Francisco office tower, mostly empty, open to offers. But look at that. This is on California Street. And you've it's, been to it's San Francisco. It's the perfect location. Yep. If you can get past the needles and the feces, it's on California <laughs> yeah. Street. And, and um, the, lobby, the lobby's beautiful, but just outside the lobby, there's a little bit of a funk, a little smell. But, yeah. uh, if, you get, but if you get past that this smell. This is actually a great building in what has been historically a great um, uh, commercial address. Tom, in this was worth $300 million in 2019. It's a 22 story building and is expected to sell $60 million. What? Guys, from $300 million. This is this is Wall Street Journal story. Is expected to sell for $60 million. Bucks, cream of the crop, San Francisco. Do you know they're expecting anywhere between $1.5 trillion 
to three trillion dollars high low of defaults in commercial real estate because they're, they're, they're about to be called with the new rates they're not going to be able to make a lot of these payments so a class a and right now the biggest building in fort lauderdale i want to look at it this week to see if there's any interest of wanting to buy it. it's the biggest building in fort lauderdale how many square feet is it we looked at it it's a um, four hundred thousand square yeah, feet yeah it's 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 <clears throat> mammoth we're talking we're talking multiple partner companies we could have in there we're talking campus it's huge it's it's massive four hundred thousand square foot building you You've wow. seen this building. It's off of federal. Okay. And, you know, <clears throat> who's renting nowadays? Commercial real estate, Class A, businesses are not renting those types of offices today. It's a very – a lot of things has happened to commercial real estate the last three days. If there's any sector of the market, specifically real estate, that got hit because of COVID, it's commercial real estate. You know what is doing well in commercial real estate? Industrial buildings. Because industrial, they need spaces to go under, do manufacturing, do all this mm -hmm. other stuff. But when it comes down to the high rises, this is going to be just the beginning. Guys with cash in the next 6, 12, 24 months are going to have some very, very weird opportunities to buy buildings. There's going to be so many auctions going on right now. If you got cash, you could pick up some real nice properties today, specifically in commercial real estate. And I, th I think when you look around, you, sometimes you can't see what's happening in businesses. But let me tell you, this is a strong economy overall. This is the United States. We're not going away, and we're still the reserve currency. But I'll, I'll, I'll use value tainment maybe as like a little case study. People can't see what we're doing. I mean, this what we're building, the company we're building here. And what we're looking for in terms of space, we've tremendous. We're running these conferences. We got the conference team. We got the ad team. We've got the media team. Decentralized media is here, and that is the bedrock of what we're growing. Your podcast is here, at Jedediah. There are so many things that are going on. So when you hear this, there are companies like us, and this is what we're doing in media, looking for huge opportunities. And we're about to find huge opportunities because the properties on sale to go do the kind of things that we're already doing and already in position to do. Perfect transition into the story. Vice is set to be headed for wow. bankruptcy May 1st. New York Times story. Nobody would have guessed this was coming. It was a $5.7 billion company just a minute ago. And now they're talking about going on auction. So Vice Media is preparing for to file bankruptcy after being unable to find a buyer. Vice's largest debt holder, Fortress Investment Group, could end up controlling the company in the event of bankruptcy, with Vice continuing to operate normally and running an auction to sell the company for a 45-day period, with Fortress in a pole position as the most likely acquired a company, which began as a punk magazine in Montreal more than two decades ago, has blossomed into a global media company with a movie studio and ad agency, glossy show on HBO, and bureaus in, in far-flung world capitals. Its investors have included Disney and Fox, but a bearish market for digital media companies and Vice's inability to turn a profit has taken their toll. Jet, thoughts on this story? Did you see Andrew Tate talking about this online, by the way? Because they did that documentary on him. Yeah. That guy, you know, Matt Lachey or whatever he was, was completely corrupted. I mean, total tool. But, you know, it's interesting. You know, what's going to happen? I guess, I guess, you know, you look at the... If you look at what Vice has put forth, you know, for the past several years, I don't know if any how familiar you are with Vice. I, and I, I've work, seen the documentaries. It's a, it's a lot of woke stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of, you know, I, I think people are really tired of the messaging at these locations. I think it's going to be really hard for pretend organizations, as I call them. You know, Vice was pretending to be, oh, we're here to deliver the news. We're yeah. here to be objective. We're, and when you don't do that, people aren't stupid. They look at that and they say, well, I'm just going to turn this off. And I think it was really interesting because Andrew Tate was front and center. That documentary was front and center. And it was garbage. I mean, I did it on my show. I analyzed it piece by piece. It wasn't, it was just a manifestation of what was going on there. This deception, this manipulation of the public. People are really tired of that stuff. I think Disney is suffering big time as a result of what they're doing with the wokeness injected into kids' cartoons. And people just want you to be straight with them. If yep. you're a hard left, progressive, as I call it, regressive organization, if that's your line, if, the, if you're an MSNBC, or just own what you're doing. Own your agenda. I think a lot of these uh, totally. organizations are getting into trouble because they're trying to trick the public. Oh, this is objective journalism. It's not. People see it, and then they just say, well, I'm not going to go here for my information mm. because now you've been deceptive with me. I can't trust anything you're saying. I think that's been a big part of why you saw the crumble. And I saw just a lot of celebration of just, they feel like, oh, fine. It's been exposed. Mm -hmm. You know, this 
this was basically a facade for a really long time. I'm not saying they did no good work, but the challenge is when you do some good work and then in you have peppered all of this nonsense, you ruin your brand. So decide what you want to be. Be honest and authentic with the public and you will receive a good return. If you don't, you get this. Do, do you think it's a brand worth buying? With what no. they've done, the content, anything they have, none of it is worth buying. Like if it, if you could get it out of fire sale, is it worth buying? I don't know. I think I. I what, why would you need to buy Vice? Why Why couldn't you do what they're doing? I, I don't know why you would need to buy it. I, I can't justify that. The, In the same way that BuzzFeed. I don't know if you saw a lot of people tweeting, oh, should I buy BuzzFeed? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't suggest that. Why? Do it better. Why do you need to buy that sure. entity that's already failed? And I, that's, I mean, I don't. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, I tend to agree. And then I see another side of it, too. So I'll take, take a counter side. I, I looked at some of these announcements today on Vice. And what I did was I just kind of looked at it through the lens of Twitter. So a large debt holder fortress comes in. And then everybody else has to stand to the side, kind of like Elon Musk coming in and buying Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bunch of stuff going on inside here that is not profitable, they shouldn't be doing. And you immediately cut that the same way that uh, Elon Musk said, hey, these 10 projects over here for technology, I'm cutting them. I'm still working on this stuff over here. All you people, wait, wait, another group on censorship? Okay, you're gone too. And by the time he was done, he only had 20% of the people left. And guess what? Twitter works really, really well right now still. And, you know, blue checks and all the other stuff is done. You can debate that if you will. But he's showing that the, the company's actually growing. Twitter is growing. Mm -hmm. And from a pruning to growing. And so I look at this and I'm like, wow, you know, we got a movie studio. We got this and this and this and this and this. What if somebody comes in like Fortress? Because Fortress has said, we're going to continue to operate normally while we're running an auction process. And I think what will happen is Fortress has to look at it through two ways. One, I'm going to end up like a PE firm. I'm going to end up owning this son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to be stuck with it. So what are they going to do? They're going to be doing layoffs and trimming things, seeing it do it. So I see like a Twitter comparison where Fortress might end up running Vice Light only some things that are actually you know profitable and worthwhile. Now, that said, I was also reading in media that said there's not a lot of consumer connect to the Vice brand. They don't have stickiness across everything. They're just present and it's one thing to be present like you know like you know a, a channel on TV um, like the USA Network, you're kind of present, but there's no real stickiness to the USA Network. You know what I mean? That's right. That's You're right. And and also, don't you think, I mean, see, to me, the comparison to Twitter is interesting, but Twitter was sticky. Twitter was a place, it had its flaws. I can understand somebody going in like an Elon Musk and wanting to buy Twitter because even though it has its flaws, there was so much good about mm -hmm. it. It was so much hot yeah. about it. It was so sticky. So much so that even people who couldn't stand some of the censorship that was happening and some of the nonsense that was happening in the last two years still couldn't take themselves off of it, yeah. right? You're like addicted to it because there's something <clears throat> really cool and interesting and energy and energetic about it. Vice isn't that. It's yep. just kind of existing. And for me, Vice feels very much like corporate media right now. It's there. It's happening. But why would somebody go in? If you had the power, you're PBD, right? You have the power to go in and say, okay, I can buy this. Why would you buy that? You can do it better yourself. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's going to have the power to buy that is going to have the power to do it better without any of the tainted nonsense that comes with the baggage of that organization. That's that's what I I think love what you said too, Jed. You said uh, own your agenda. At least be honest. If you're honest, you'll work. If you're if you're full of shit, people stiff you. What a you great on. line. I love own that. your agenda. Own what your agenda. Great. Be honest. I love Put it on a shirt, so, no, that's yours. So, that's all you. And, and so, don't, don't shoot me, PBD, but I, I'll, I'll say this Rob, out loud. where's the gun? <laughs> no, but I'll say this out Rob, loud. Rob, gun. Get the gun, gun. You know, I, I took the call today for Valuetainment because they know that we're capable. Yeah. And I spoke to an analyst at... Uh, mm -mm, I can mm -mm, say mm -mm. this one. I can say this one. Not the second one. You can give the first one, not the second Tom. one. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll give neither one. But I spoke to two analysts, and both of them are like, "Hey, f you know, um, you know, Fortress is looking for potential, you know, acquirer partners. You guys obviously have the capability. You know, uh, two weeks is there going to be a package out on this?" And I'm like, "Absolutely, we'd like to look at it. We'd like to look at it." But you know, we're on. To your point, we're on the list, and we could do this. And the question is, you bring up a good point. Why would you.
How come you don't put Vinny and I on the call me acquisition calls? Yeah, please. I'm just curious. Please. I think that would be great. Well, listen, I didn't want to make <laughs> that public, but w- that's uh, the final quote. You know oh, <laughs> when we <laughs> want to close, <laughs> you guys yeah. don't stay out of it. You know what? I want Vinny on with these analysts. I've got corporate counsel on here. If yeah. you could record that, can you imagine? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's Damn Vinny, it. and, yeah, it's Vinny and Jeff. What's up? <laughs> I got your habeas corpus right here. Hey, yeah. but, but, you know, the one thing that is going on, the one thing that is going on that there's no question about, there is a massive shakeup disruption going on in media as an industry, as a space right now. Huge. Whether it's people questioning fake news, whether it's some people transitioning out, whether it's Rupert Murdoch wanting to go to a different direction, whether it's, you know, CNN and... And Malone saying we're done with Don Lemon and, you know, whether it's, you know, Vice, whether it's BuzzFeed. There's a, there's a lot of this stuff that's going on right now. And, and you know, even Disney is kind of a, a packaging ESPN to, you know, in a quiet way to say ESPN could be for sale for the right number. There's a lot of shakeup going up right now. And let's talk about Tucker. Obviously, at this point of the game, we hear the stories about what's going on with Tucker. Tucker's video was posted. I don't know how many views it got at this point. If it's shy of 100 million, I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't. The world has seen Tucker's video, the message that he gave. And if you speak sign language, you understand what Tucker was talking about. When he's code language, you understand what Tucker was talking about. And recently, just recently, I think even yesterday, a leaked video derides Fox streaming service. Okay, if you've seen this clip, this video of Tucker that everybody is playing, and and we've all seen it. Everybody's seen it at this point. You know, I, I don't want to be a slave to Fox Nation, which I don't think that people watch anyways. We're going to, because you know I'm a like a representative of the American media now, speaking to an exile in Romania, welcoming him back into brotherhood of journalists. You know, and he's, you know, this is a, Carlson says on a video footage from 2022 leaked to Media Matters. I wonder who from Fox News leaked it to Media Matters, where Media Matters can't stand Fox News, but nobody's going to watch it Probably on Fox Council. Nation. Nobody watches Fox Nation because the site sucks. So I'd really like to just adjust and put the dump, the whole thing, on YouTube. Carlson was apparently speaking to representative for Internet Personality, Andrew Tate, who was recently detained in Romania on charges of human trafficking. Anyways, there's a lot of different things that's going on with Tucker. Newsmax is at the front. Rumble is saying they may do something with it. There's talks about Rumble could be doing some kind of stuff with Tucker. Jet, you've been in this world. Mm-hmm. You you speak very, very highly of Tucker. The other day we were having dinner. You were telling me he was one of the smartest guy you ever worked with. You told us that's this when right. we are having dinner. What can you say about what's going on? And where do you think this guy's going to end up? I mean, he's a, Tucker is a rock star, right? Tucker is one of the people that you actually work with and you know that he believes what he's saying, that he's committed to principle, that if he makes a mistake and gets something wrong, he's going to say it, which is so incredibly rare in media. Tucker is going to be a rock star no matter what he does. Uh, I think he's going to go off and do something on his own. He may start a company of his own. He will get his voice and his content and his message out to people. So I think people could rest assured that he's not going away anytime soon. I think his video that now I think has almost 80 million uh, reach, I think, express that. He's also laughing about these leaks. I mean, this is very predictable. When you work in corporate media they they very obviously fired him they very obviously silenced him over at fox he was very clearly having editorial conflict with senior leadership and just wasn't going to sit down and shut up i i actually watched that leak video and i liked him more because (laughs) it was just him being him they think they've got stuff on this guy and what they don't realize is that what people really love about him is that he wasn't playing the game and that he was on the inside fighting this censorship and fighting this you can say this but you can't say that and fighting this you can you can do these topics because what happens is there are untouchable topics in corporate media so you do have some freedom to move left and right but you're still in a straitjacket. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. And if you do, and if you, you know, go against the powers that be, you either lose your job or you have to leave or you have to negotiate and exit. That's what happened here. I don't believe for a second that this is about some little internal text messages or nonsense like that. They were looking for a reason to get rid of this guy because this guy wasn't playing ball the way they wanted him to play ball. So... I think it's really interesting. You're going to see more of these leaks. You ask, you know, who's responsible for the leaks. The senior leadership there knows this is happening. They're probably authorizing it in many ways. They love it. They think they're going to have the power to wreck this guy, and they don't. They also, if you've seen the ratings, 
The ratings are destroyed over there. Yeah. They're destroyed because people, and it's not just about Tucker. Yes, Tucker was a rock star. You can't just replace Tucker with somebody. But also people are so tired of being lied to. They're so tired of being lied to, and they know that when they watch these networks, you're, these these people, these individuals, these talking heads are called talking heads for a reason. I was there. I know the restrictions that were placed on me. Again, you have a little bit of flexibility, but not a lot. They know that they're not getting the real truth. They know they're not getting the real story. They know that people are kowtowing to avatar, advertisers and you know pharma and and corporate you know lackeys at the top. And they don't want to watch that anymore. When they can watch stuff like this, we're just sitting here having a conversation. They can go on Twitter. They can go on Substack. They can get real citizen journalists and get to the truth of the matter. So I think Tucker has a career no matter what. I think he's a rock star no matter what. I think he's completely irreplaceable in that slot, by the way. Um, you think he's multidimensional? Meaning he can absolutely. do podcasts, show, When I the, started, all that stuff. And, so, and, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because, you know, when you talk about Rogan, Mm -hmm. I can't ever see Rogan being put on a box and saying, here's uh, uh, six writers for you. They wrote what to say no. and go do this. I don't think Joe, I think Joe would be miserable doing that. Yeah. I think to me, Tucker is a multifaceted talent that wherever you put him, he's going to be able to do it. Tucker is a media yeah. savvy star. And I remember coming into this business. I wrote for him over at the Daily Caller yeah. for a little while. I worked with every time I worked with him. We worked on Red Eye together. We would sit. He's he's spontaneous. He's full of personality. Tucker has that thing that I talked about before, by the way, that Ron DeSantis doesn't have. When I'm talking about that thing, it, it the mm -hmm. it factor, he has it. And I always spoke highly of him when I first, and I know there are some people at Fox, by the way, um, in very high level positions who you know, were highly responsible for Tucker's rise that probably are rolling over now like they don't know what to do because they know his power and they know his talent and they know his capability, but they're fighting the internal machine. They have no, they really have no power at the end of the day. Um, but he is that guy. I think you can stick him in a cable news setting. You can sit him in a network, network TV setting. You can sit him in a speech. You can sit him on a stage. You can sit him in a conversation like this. Yeah. He can just roll. This is his thing because you know why he's just him. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid to just be him, to be silly, to say, I don't know, I think I screwed up, mm -hmm. to get on stage and say something that say, I'm not an expert at that. Mm -hmm. People are dying for that. Yep. So I think he he goes, I think this only grows. Whatever he plans to do, he will be making more money and reaching more people post Fox than he did while he was there. People call him a media personality, and I kind of disagree with that. I, I think he's a media leader. I look at what he did at Daily Caller. I look at what he did on his own show. I mean, he's a, he's not just a leading voice. He's a leading thinker and he's a leader. He's a media leader. And so wherever he goes, you know, if I was sitting there, I, yeah, I'd be sitting there saying, where can I really lead? Where can I be more than just this? Because I don't think, I mean, if he went someplace like Sirius for the, the Howard Stern contract, that's one dimensional. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's your, here, here you go, Howard. Here's just, you want 10 producers, there's 10 producers. You want 20 writers, there's 20 writers. Now go, just go sit and do your, do your show. Uh, Stern, that, that worked, I mean, for, for Sirius. They got the subscribers they wanted, kind of. But that's that's so one-dimensional. This guy is so much broader. I, I believe he's a media leader, and I think he's going to land on his feet someplace that gives him that platform and that canvas and that to be freedom. the full person. He also, Tucker hosted, I hosted a show called Fox and Friends Weekend for a while. Um, Tucker hosted that show before I got there. He was the guy on the show. He was fantastic. He gave that show life. He was the reason I wanted to take the job because I was very hesitant to take that job for many reasons. But I was like, oh man, look what he did with it. You know, mm -hmm. and you get there and you realize that you've been watching that show with Tucker on it. And then you're part of that show without Tucker. And it was missing Tucker. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the kind of guy that comes into a room and you really just feel like, wow, this is whatever we do here is going to be great because he's part of it. Mm -hmm. So and, 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 you know, this isn't about whether you agree with him on everything. Mm -hmm. This is about a guy who was telling you the truth, who was uncomfortable sitting behind the veil of corporate media uh -uh. manipulation and censorship. And that's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. You know, I, w I would uh, uh, say a couple things when you look at the viewership they showed. So Megan Kelly showed this on her message, I'm, I'm sure on her video, how his episode last Thursday was uh, two point. Okay, Tucker's finale was 2.65 million at the 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Monday was 2.59. He wasn't on. Tuesday, one seven. By Wednesday, half the audience left. Okay, literally half the audience left wow. by Wednesday. Okay, and and it's got to be very hard for the person that replaces Tucker. Okay, and obviously, look who tweeted that with the data. 
Brian Stelter. <laughs> Brian Brian Stelter, Brian. honestly, his show never did the point three three or whatever the side is. <laughs> yeah, that's let true. Alone. So, so Brian is uh, is uh, you know went from and now he's talking about the fact that Don Lemon and Tucker are texting each other and you know imagine what could happen if they have a show together the two and and obviously Megan made a very good point. Megan's like I don't think Tucker would ever reach out to Don Lemon. Don Lemon is the one that's probably reached out to him because they shared a lawyer. Whether whoever reached out to who or not, it's irrelevant. Tucker's number one. Period. So it's not like. You know, uh, Tucker needs Lemon's advice. Lemon needs Tucker's advice, and it's good for Lemon and you know to sh- talk with uh, Tucker on what to do. I remember the first time we started this. Uh, Mario says, "Hey, let's start creating content." We bought a teleprompter. Do you know how long, how many times I used a teleprompter for thirty seconds? Knows it. It's- <laughs> they they put the teleprompter there, and and, and within thirty seconds, I'm like. I, I take this thing out of here. I mean, we <laughs> lost money on the teleprompter. We bought the nice, fancy, not the iPad teleprompter. Yeah, you know, scrolling. what's the yeah, I, yeah. I, We bought the full blown teleprompter yeah. thinking it's going to be. I'm like, I can't. So, so to we be, put it back in the box, tried to return we, it, but it was already broken. No, no, so. nobody. Right, yeah, it was yeah. already broken. Nobody could. <laughs> it, it, there's a very, there's only a few people that can do what Tucker does. And matter of fact, at his level, he's number one. Let's put him up there. Do you think, because here's the, here's the conversation. When Bill O'Reilly left, no one's going to replace Bill O'Reilly. Everybody said this. Oh, it's going to be done. Game over. Megan Kelly. Oh, nobody. It's, just, it's done. It's over. Tucker Carlson. Oh, well, it's done. It's over. What is different, Jed, about Tucker than when it happened with Megan than when it happened with O'Reilly? I don't know that it's Tucker. I think it's the time, and I think it's the awareness that people have of what corporate media is, and I think it's the options that they have. So it was a time where you didn't have a lot of options. You turned on the TV. That's what you saw. People would, I mean, I know, like my parents even, old school, put the TV on, you watch the news, you shut it off. That's your option. Now with podcasting is what being what it is, with Twitter streaming, with Rumble, with VT, with all of these options, people are now seeing what corporate media is. So it's not just a rejection of like, oh, hey, you can't just replace Tucker and and expect me to be a drone and keep the TV on. It's not just people saying that, but it's them saying, I know that you're misleading me. I know that I'm not getting an authentic experience here. I'm tired of it. That People weren't that tired and weren't as informed of how horribly censored this stuff was when Megyn Kelly left, when Bill O'Reilly left. So... You know, I, I think it's just a different time. I think they're playing with fire. I think corporate media doesn't really understand that these people that are now on Twitter, that are on social, that are in Substack, that are they, they just know what you're doing. Yeah. They don't need you anymore. Yep. They don't need you. And they count on, by the way, the Fox News of the world, the ABC. And by the way, you know, this is go, this is not just about Fox News. ABC censored that RFK video. I don't know if you saw. They put a big disclaimer. Mm-hmm. Give me a break. If you if you were so confident, debate the guy. No, you don't have the facts. Yeah. So you've got to censor him. It happens all the time. That's like the view screaming at me. Oh, misinformation. Really? You didn't have the facts, honey, or you would have let me say my piece and you would have said yours. Yep. So I think there's just a deep awareness now. There's a rejection of the same. Fox is counting on people just leaving their TV on like oh they'll get over this yeah I, I i just i don't think so i think your time is coming to an end where you think it's coming to an end i i you really think, think to an end? i think fox <clears throat> is changing drastically i think when they did that segment about you know the trans stuff as it related to kids and it was like a celebration day I, people were ago, like on fox yep. news i think there's been a lot of censorship i think there's been firings that people have noticed wait a minute these are free thinking people that no longer have a home i think their brand is changing i think someone may may, may make a, a purchase of that brand at some point fox is not the fox of 10 years ago mm-hmm. And I think even the older audience, I mean, my parents even, you know, it's funny. I left Fox. This is people laugh about this, but I left Fox. And even occasionally they would still put the TV on. What were they watching, though? Tucker. 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 Because it was like the last bastion of a guy who wouldn't play ball the way they wanted him to play. You know, you know what's crazy is right now there's talks that Maria Bartiromo is next and Judge Piro is next. That those conversations are mm-hmm. yeah. being thrown around left and of right. Course. And and everybody is you know, sitting there wondering if there's going to be a decision like this being made. Here's my thing. Here, here's here's the question. That I have a conversation with somebody this weekend, and it, I, I may be making a very strange announcement sometime today. Weird announcement. Bold announcement on behalf of entertainment. So stay tuned. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm on. I'm <laughs> talk- We're all like, what Weird is and it? Bold. Weird I'm, and I'm bold. I'm talking to Megan Kelly today at 1 o'clock. I may announce it on Megan Kelly today at 1 o'clock when I talk to her. Uh, but but here's the thing. Here, here's the one thing I think about. We were having dinner. If It's, it, it, it's me, you, Tom. 
Vinny and this guy, what's his name? This good looking guy. He's the second best looking guy in the building. What's oh, this Adam. guy's name? Adam. <laughs> Adam. Adam is his name. Adam's Vinny awesome. took over looks, yeah. right? And if, oh, wait a minute. I thought you were talking about Jeremy. The, the bearded, <laughs> Jeremy's a good looking guy, the, too. No, no. The he, bearded muscle he's guy. He's the man. he's the muscular bodybuilder hunk, which we got to. Have you ever put his picture up? Do people know what he used to? No. Hey, no. You got to do that one more episode. <laughs> I will. Maybe on the next episode, show what Jeremy looked I like. Will, okay, I so, will. anyways. He's the whisperer. We're so, just we're having dinner. We're having dinner, and I ask you a question. I said, I said, do you know? I'm talking to this guy i said do you know who stefan marbury is most people don't know who stefan marbury is but stefan marbury at one point was top three best guards in the nba the guy was ridiculous if you type on type uh, type in stefan marbury and go to his stats just go to his stats uh, uh if you go a little lower you'll see what his stats so stefan marbury was playing in the nba right there right there click on that and if you go a little lower to show his stats zoom in a little bit right there zoom in a little bit to show what his numbers were okay if you look at the right side points per career. game look at that points per game 23.4 22.2 23.9 20 22 20 20 this guy was an incredible player in the league but something happened he started having an attitude and all of a sudden one of the teams said you know what we're going to pay you, but we're going to bench you. And we're going to take away the best years of your playing years away from you. And then I posed the question to you guys. And I said, do you think Fox is sitting there saying, our agreement, we will continue to fulfill our obligation of what we have to pay you, the remaining whatever time is left on a contract, the year, two years, but you can't go anywhere. And you can go somewhere two years from now, but we're going to continue paying you. And then everybody had a different opinion to say, well, you know, this, this, that, you know, all this other stuff. Because typically somebody can come and buy that contract out from another team. The team that Marbury was playing for, they're like, no, we're not even selling a contract. This guy didn't play his best for us and we're paying him money. They're, they're paying him six and 18 million a year. You're not even going to get any playing time. Do you think Fox at all, any percentage that the strategy Fox is playing right now is to keep him benched for as long as possible to hurt Tucker Carlson? Do you think that's what a strategy Fox may be playing today? I don't think it's to hurt Tucker Carlson. I think it's to keep him quiet through potentially through maybe the next election cycle. I mean, this guy is a you danger to the system. This agenda goes really deep. This isn't just about Tucker. This is about what Tucker's talking about. This is about what he's putting front and center. Yeah. So there was always this idea that, you know, if you were battling the system, you were battling the left, left versus right. That is not what's happening. Yeah. That is not what's happening. These are regular people who care about their freedom battling the system. Some people call it the system. Some people call it the matrix. Corporate media is that system. It's the censorship system. It's the be quiet, sit down, shut up, sit, do what I tell you. And there's so many talking heads willing to play by that game. So it's, it's, it's less about Tucker. It's about what Tucker was shining a light on. It's about the powers that be that the people at Fox in, answer to. Who's their boss? Mm. Who are they getting messages from? So Who do saying, they report to? But you think there is a possibility that they're benching in between? Yeah, I do think that, okay. well, right now, especially now because they're yeah. negotiating now, typically what will happen is there's two options. Either they're going to bench him the full duration of that contract and he's going to get paid, but he's not going to be able to go anywhere, which is a horrible thing to do. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to negotiate an exit and they will have to do some type of payout, but he will have freedom to go find another position or do whatever he wants. And once he starts that then he will no longer get paid by Fox News. But I they, I mean, they lose big time if they silence this guy long term. If they make a decision that they are going to cave to whoever they answer to in the system, and we know there are people you answer to, if they make that decision, people are going to be aware that they've, okay. they've silenced this Let guy. Let me throw a crazy thing out there, crazy thing out there. And if there's anybody qualified to speak on this, guys, Jedediah just crossed 200,000 subs. If you're a supporter of her message, let's get that channel and her voice to a million subs as soon. We may even put a party to get and do a jet event at 500,000 subs, and we'll make some announcements on that where we'll Jet is up to. But, Jet, there's two guys you speak about a lot. One is a guy named Andrew Tate, which I don't know if you've heard of this guy before. He's a very loud guy. <laughs> I have. And another guy named Tucker Carlson. Is it fair to say you respect both of these guys? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I just got word from uh, uh, a uh, – uh, uh, Andrew's camp, literally right now, the text just came in, and the text says the appeal against the house arrest extension was rejected today again, so the boys will remain under house arrest until the end of May. So here's another one that they're doing. The last one they can do this on is June. I want to jump on a call with these guys right after this, right after I'm done with the Dream Team call. So um, <sighs> okay, 
I'm having a conversation with their camp. And the concern is every month Romania extends this delay more and more and more and more and more. The red pill community that, you know, talks about what they talk about, the cream of the crop at the top of the red pill community is one guy right now. It's Andrew Tate. Okay. Mm -hmm. When he's out there, everybody's doing what they're doing. And, you know, you're, you're able to drive that. And I think Tucker kind of plays to that at the cream of the crop of his space today where Tucker's at and where Tate is at, right? How crazy of a idea would it be that those two names would be the two names that we don't want to do a lot of talking right now for them to stay quiet? Are you going in a direction where the same way Romania is kind of maybe, if there isn't anything, because every month is allegedly, 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 there's nothing no really anything. Yeah, no charges at all. Do you think there is really the crazy strategy that the people that are the leaders of the Matrix are trying to silence a Tucker and a Andrew? Well, Do you think they're... there's a possibility of that? Of course. I mean, these are two guys that, again, they're not playing ball. They they refuse to be silenced. I mean, you see Andrew Tate, he's under house arrest, but he's tweeting. He's reaching so he's reaching more people on Twitter than people on cable news who get on TV every day, get their hair and makeup done and put on a big show. So they're still powerful. And if you don't think that, that folks in the system, the powers that be, are looking and saying – we try to take this guy out. He's he's not even able to go do interviews yet or anything for, you know, probably legal reasons. And look at his reach. Tucker Carlson puts a tweet out and it reaches more people million. than the guy who was hosting in his old time slot on a cable news network that is the leader in cable news. So, of course, they want these guys silenced. They, and, and what's deeply threatening about the Andrew Tates and the Tucker Carlson's is that when you take something away from them, you know, putting Andrew Tate in jail, look what you took away from him. A lot. He was away from his family, sitting in a jail cell. I mean, this is not this is not easy for people to go through. You look what you t- take away from Tucker Carlson, an amazing platform. You take something away from them, and they turn around and they say, "I'm not being quiet." Mm-hmm. Andrew Tate come out just as controversial, saying what needs to be said in the same way as before. Tucker Carlson puts a video out after being fired and silenced, talking about silencing. They're not messing around. You cannot shut these guys up. That is the golden ticket. So they will continue to be influential. And do I think the system is targeting both of them? 100%. Do I think the system's going to win? Nope. No way. We're on the same page. <laughs> okay, completely on the same page. And, you know, there's, there's two sides to this. There's the, there's the censorship and the messaging and playing ball side that um, Jed, Jed's talking about. And then there's also the legal side. And the legal side has been a... A river of failures every time people have tried to block block people. And one of the things you can go back and look at is um, a lot of you are not old enough to remember, but when Letterman and Leno, they were both under the property of NBC. And NBC decided we're gonna Johnny Carson's retiring and we're gonna put Leno in the tonight show. Uh, Letterman was at the you know twelve thirty time slot, the late show with David Letterman, and it was um, you know, Letterman said, I think I earned that chair. I earned the 1130 chair, Johnny Carson's chair. And they said, well, no, we're going to keep you on your on your contract. And Bob Wright and Warren Littlefield completely fumbled it. And Mike Ovitz put together a counteroffer that, that delevered um, uh, their position. And that's how CBS <laughs> got Letterman and put him in the 1130 time slot. And for the next five years crush Leno in, in ratings. And this is the legal side, folks. There is always a way out. There's It's just like Fight Club. There's always a way out, just on the legal side. But now, in the modern time, you also have this other side where you have this, this you got to play ball with our message, and there is, you know, we can go down the rabbit hole even further to what I believe is a, you know, a single party system in the United States with two kind of colors in it rather than really a two party system. You're talking but- my language on the <laughs> uniparty, Tom. You're getting me very, very excited here talking about the uniparty. I'm just saying. Like, no, but I, I, I'm saying you can go back and look at this. And so, you know, it's not the contract that the pe- that they're going to have a trouble with. The contract is extricatable, very extricatable. Um, the, the issue is they don't want the voice out there to compete with their programming. But at the end of the day, they got to make a buck. And right now, um, they are not making a buck and they are slipping. And if they're just waiting for the smoke to clear to come back, there's nothing there on the plate that people find appetizing at, at Fox. What you once were, you have given up. You're not there anymore. 
And that's why decentralized media is where it's going to. Large corporate media is is not just dead. It's in hospice. And those that are still alive are in hospice and are dying, but you just don't see it. The opportunities of tomorrow is in decentralized new media that is distributed in new and different ways, ladies and gentlemen. And you got to thank God for like Elon Musk. Thank, if, imagine if he didn't buy Twitter, Jed, and there was still all that censorship with the FBI and everything. Right. You wouldn't hear none of these guys speak. Rumble and all that. I mean, all those other like, what's that truth social? No, nah, but the reach. So, dude, thank God for Elon Musk, man. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I tell you, Spotify. Oh, by Penny Alec, which, by the way, he made a very strange announcement recently saying we will promise to not make any major offers anymore. Oh. Uh, 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 he said this from Spotify. I think Spotify, Rum- Rumble, you have to give credit to what Rumble's doing. They're playing a very important role. Mm-hmm. Twitter, c- p- a credit to uh, what uh, Musk was doing. Fox yeah. screwed up because Fox was also one that was at least Tucker was there to, that he can talk and say the stuff that he was saying. But those guys play a very important role with what's going on today. Let's go to the next story. Uh, uh, A few things with um, Sanders uh, talking about Biden. You guys saw this last week with the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Uh, A bunch of different things was said, you know, the jokes. You know, I I, I actually thought some of the stuff that was written. The writers were good, Pat. You have to give credit to the writers on what they said. But Biden joked about his age, needing a helmet for DNC events, and made report on his declining work hours. Finally. He just wasn't, like, holding back. You know, if he's going to be running again, he'll be an 86-year-old president. You know, you know, some of the jokes were, you know, I promise you I'm working like hell to get home. You know, <laughs> uh, a bunch of other things. You know, one of the things he said, he says, look, there's a lot of media companies here. CNBC is here. The owners of CNBC, the owners of this, and the owners of Fox Dominion is here. You know, these things, when he said it, was actually funny. So credit to the writer. I thought that part was funny. Now, at the same time, there was a Bernie Sanders came out and says Biden could win in a landslide. Okay. Senator Bernie Sanders said Biden, who kicked off his reelection campaign last week, could win in a landslide in 2024, given the current political uh, backdrop of a major political party, the Republican Party, where many of the leadership doesn't even believe in democracy. Sanders stressed that he thinks Biden is the clear choice for voters. And if Democrats and the president get stronger on working class issues and take on the greed of the insurance companies, working class, he believes Biden's going to win in a landslide. Sanders waved off concerns about Biden's age and stressed that what voters have to look at is what does the candidate stand for? Which side are they on? Jet, when you hear a story like this, do you agree with Bernie Sanders that Biden could win in a landslide? I do. I do think he could win. I think people need, need to be prepared for that. Um, and I did. I said this last time. In fact, we had a, a, a debate in my house. Uh, my parents are you know, different degrees of conservative, but they were like, oh, there's no way. There's no way Biden's going to win. I said, he's going to win. Mark my words, he is going to win. And he did. And I think people need to be prepared because corporate media wants Biden to win. And by the way, that includes... Fox News. I, they want Biden yep. to win. They they do better when they're going against Biden. They, that that is their business model. That's how it works. Um, corporate media wants Biden to win. Hollywood wants Biden to win. The, the entertainment business at large wants Biden to win. The system wants Biden to win. Um, Biden has a lot of very powerful people in his corner. I think when you couple that with the fact that the Republican base is so split right now between DeSantis and Trump, as we talked about before, I think there are weaknesses, big weaknesses in both of those candidates. Um, and I I think you have obstacles like young female single voters. They're not voting Republican. It's not happening. They're looking for big daddy government to be what, you know, they're <laughs> missing male head of household used to be. I know I'll get heat for that, but it's true. And you have a, a growing segment of the population that wants something for nothing. They want something for nothing. And you have a lot of people in this country now that are deeply compliant, that prefer for the government to tell them what to do for than for them to figure out how to do it themselves. Do you have freedom lovers? Yes. Do you have increasing number of people who aren't that way? Yes. So do I think Joe Biden could win a landslide? Yes. I think that's a sad reality that people should start to wrap their heads around. And I do believe, by the way, the bigger fight and the more worthwhile fight is in local politics, is in community politics. Go find, set yourself up somewhere, city, state, that you feel supports and protects the values that you believe in. And those are the votes that matter more than these national elections. So I, I would not be surprised. So are you, are, you, are you saying you may run for something? Is that <laughs> can you like, imagine me running for I would something? Lo- I would I vote. I actually can. I would can vote. Can you imagine I would vote I, I, I actually can. You, you'd have my vote. <laughs> Tom, thoughts on this? 
Uh, Tom's going to be my running mate. You're going to do the business side of things. By the way, that would be oh my God. very <laughs> interesting. Can you imagine? Me and Tom, that could be really So, Jed, what are you going to do with the economy? Tom? <laughs> Tom. <laughs> and Tom, Tom you have to do the bill. You have to be Bill Clinton. I love it. You have it. to talk as Bill Clinton for the whole I think I we've got it. a plan for the economy. <laughs> and honey, honey here is going to lead this country in ways that you don't understand. <laughs> I would vote. You guys got my vote. Hang on, hang on a second. Tall crown and water. Remember with the lime thing. <laughs> the um, so what I think is going on here is Judge Wright. You know, if this is misplayed by the GOP, this could be a Biden land side, but that's not going to be a Biden land side by decision. It'll be by default. Here's what I mean by that: If the Republicans don't put together a compelling case and a compelling candidate served up in the right way, then it's going to look confusing. And if it's a bloodbath in the primaries and everything kind of goes haywire, then there's nothing for the voter to really latch on to. Then you'll have a Biden landslide by default, meaning there's nothing for there's nothing to move that 10, 12 percent of the independent voter in the middle, which is what the election, all national elections now hinge on. So I think it could happen, but they've got to get their act together now and make a compelling case on the candidates and not overpackage candidates and let them be themselves. Because I think there's a candidate in there the voters are going to love and they're going to see the contrast and they're going to want a difference and it's going to be stark. But if that gets fumbled, then you'll get a you'll get a landslide by default, not because they love it, but just by default, because the 10 percent, 12 percent of the independent in the middle aren't going to move. But just it blows my mind, though, that that independent 10, 15, 12 percent cannot just look at what the hell's going on. Nothing is going right. I don't care how you see it, where you left or right. How, how like is, do you think, Jed, that the uh, their whole abortion stance the, the, that can sway? The election one way or the other? Well, I think, again, you have those, like, young female. It's a very important voting block. People mm-hmm. always underestimate that young, single woman. Mm-hmm. That's who hears these, the wokeness, who hears the platitudes. Biden talks in these, like, ridiculous platitudes, like he's promising you the sun, the moon, and the stars. Who Who's receptive to that? You have to be an emotional voter to be receptive to that. You have to be willing to be the exact opposite of what Tom was describing. Tom was asking before, well, do you think that, you know, voters are going to be more practical, that they're going to look at the economy and they're going to be able to get past character no the emotional voters looking at oh that was a mean tweet i can't vote for him i'd rather vote for this guy over here who told me that there's leprechauns and rainbows you know i I want that that makes me feel good about Mm -hmm. myself it's about feelings not about actually benefiting from policies yeah what's uh, vinnie what's this video what what is this so this is this is trump (laughs) listen i laugh so as a comedian this is he's up there and he's talking about how joe biden talks and doesn't know where the (laughs) hell he is i saw the one where they split it where you actually saw the video of biden but this is one of the funniest this is trump is back and he's in full force and he's talking crap go ahead rob Rob, you gotta show this do you think at least one time he'd get up and say i'm running for president (laughs) Uh, where where am i going where the hell am i going I want to get out. Oh. Look, am I here? No, over there, over there. <laughs> Dude, Jed, that's the it. That's the, the it. it factor. Yeah. He is talking shit. Bro. <laughs> A prepackaged video <laughs> that took supposedly seven takes to get it right. <laughs> if right is what you want to call it. Oh, man. In it, he says he's running because Trump and MAGA pose a threat to democracy. Can you believe it? Dude, and, and, and like, come on, Pat. That's what don't she you means. Miss you that? can't teach that. Jet, exactly. can't Jet, teach that. He's Jet, an entertainer. He did that off the cuff. He didn't yeah. plan that. He just, yeah. in his Trump world, said, you know what? He is I'm going to go for it. it. Are you more likely, you know, and to the people watching at home right now, are you more likely to watch a debate if Trump is in it or if Trump is out? Let's say, you know, half the debates have Trump in and half the debates have Trump. I guarantee you the viewership takes a nosedive just because people find this so entertaining. It's like watching a television show unfold and he's totally unrehearsed. I love it. You can't teach it. I love it. By the way, also Newsmax um, has seen, when we were talking about Fox News before, Newsmax has seen some rises, interestingly enough, at this time. Whether or not they can sustain it. Eric Eric the 3X. Yeah, I was on with Eric last week. Um, Very interesting um, to see what happens with that as well. From 180 to 589. Mm -hmm. Wow. From 180 for eight o'clock. He's the eight o'clock, right? He's from the eight one, what is there? That's you go right. from 122 to 562. Mm-hmm. One twenty, even That's more than I said. Jump. It's like five x nearly. 
Four and a half X. Near because it. there is an age bracket of the population that's very yes. used to that. that like my yeah. dad, he watches. He's watching right now. But he, you know, he doesn't understand all Hi this dad. new media. Hi, dad. Hi, Tony. Very conservative, but Tony, how you doing? But he, you know, they don't understand all the inner workings of this new media, and they're used to click the TV on. They they'll change the channel though. They'll uh-huh. stay within that forum maybe, but they'll change the channel. So. By the way, did you did you see uh, one of your favorite people in the last three years, Fauci? Did, oh did yes. You, did you see uh, Rob? Can you, can you go to Twitter? Twitter flip flop for me. I, I want to see how this guy is handling this issue and what he says. <sighs> I just want to get your reaction, Jed. You and Vinny specifically, oh, what reaction I want to okay. go. Go to my Twitter. Go to a, uh, uh, just go to my account, Rob. Just go to my profile. The untouchable. He's the untouchable. And, and if you go down on videos, go a little bit lower. Go, go, go. It should be like the fourth one. Keep going. Keep There it is right there. Make that bigger. And I want you to see we have to get away from this blame game, folks. It's too much blaming going <laughs> yeah, on. Go ahead yeah. and play this clip for yeah. us. But I want to know what you think you and the community got wrong. Was the closing of the schools too draconian? Will he take responsibility? How much of a delay... Did the fact that nobody fully understood the asymptomatic spread of this, nobody figured out that it could actually bust through certain vaccine levels as well. What are the real masks. takeaways, the yeah. real lessons for I public think, health? Yeah. I think we have to get away from the blame game because so many <laughs> sure. of the things yeah. that you have mentioned were what unknowns at the time. It's so easy, and I made that comment uh, in my response to one of the questions that Davis Wallace Weld asked me in this the is New- in the New York Times profile in the New York Times profile and I didn't mean it as an affront to him but I said you know this is really big time monday morning quarterbacking here which- but I want this uh, uh, he's a, listen to me and I know I know the viewer the real viewers that get what I'm saying this is the most protected bureaucrat rat they they brought him out. He did exactly what he did. He's been. I have videos on my phone of him flip flip flopping about the mask. And this is what pisses me off, Jed. Zero accountability. How many congressional hearings, judiciary hearings, where Ron, Rand Paul is screaming at him and they're in your face evidence? You funded this. You did all this. Nothing will happen to him. Zero. Pat was talking about investigation year and all this, all that stuff. No, I get that. You will never see this guy, for all the people that died, for all the shit that he funded, he'll never see a prison. None of them do, and it frustrates somebody like me because I'm sitting there and I'm saying, okay, the left is the left. Is the right just there to bark and bark just to show us, oh, look, there's two sides, and I don't think there is any side yet. They don't give a shit, and they just have us. They have us by the... Well, it depends what part of the right you're talking about. Yeah. If you're talking about controlled opposition, which absolutely exists, mm-hmm. they're just, you know, they bark, do bark, this. They give you the yeah. illusion of yeah. actually fighting guys. Like, this guy's a loathsome. I Kathy hate is him. a loathsome creature. Yeah, I he love makes you. villains. You know, when you turn on a superhero movie and you see a villain, this guy makes them look 100%. Good. He is that guy. Yep. And the only person that really rivals him in terms of, in terms of villainous energy is like Klaus Schwab. I also I can turn that guy on, and there's a darkness that emanates from them. Yeah. Juxtapose him, by the way, with like a Tucker Carlson, who we talked about the strength of Tucker Carlson as being able to say, I got it wrong. Yeah. I did something wrong. You know, I, I, I would do it differently now. Even when he was talking about when Tucker, there was a video, um, he was on a podcast. I think it was Full Sand Podcast. I'm not sure. And he was talking about corporate media, and he was saying, I've been on those panels. I've done that myself, yep. and it's, it's loathsome. Yep. The ability to do that, all Fauci has to come out and say is, you know what? We got it wrong. Yeah. If we had to do it again, we'd do things differently, but he can't. Yeah. He's so happening. committed to the talking point, yeah. and he also knows there's going to be no consequence for the lies and the deceit. He is a loathsome creature. My skin crawls I, when he speaks, I lo- you're and he should be me. in jail by the Same as me. And you're right, then Jed, going off your thing about Tucker, Tucker literally in this interview, he said, That's and him, he, yeah. you know what he said, Jed? He goes, like, he goes, I was pro-Iraq war. He goes, I fucked up. He goes, I, I'm telling you guys, right. I messed up. And that, to me, grounds you as a person and makes me go, Because you're trustworthy. I trust you because you messed up. Admit it and How move on. How can you trust a guy yeah. who, when all the data emerges that he was wrong, still can't take responsibility? Fauci was responsible for giving directives about the lockdowns, for giving directives that led local and state leadership to enforce mandates, to enforce all of this stuff. He was at the top of the chain. Mm-hmm. He's the reason that people lost their businesses. He's the reason that little kids were going to school with masks on Mm -hmm. he is the reason Mm -hmm. the data does not support those decisions so what kind of human could you ever trust again if they can't own up yep he's disgusting i hate i love that you hate him just as much as i do he's loathsome he is the system yep no it's 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 worse than that i I think it's i think it's even worse than that i think that it's not just 
Fauci. It's everything that protects and abets Fauci right now. Um, that is the soulless leadership of of the country, and we need much different leaders to emerge. This is this is really stark. You I mean you do have people like Rand Paul, but Rand Paul gets portrayed. Well, he's a far right wing guy. He's uh, he's, he's medically trained and everything, and he's going to scream a lot. Let's just get through this. Whenever he's in a, a hearing, you know, you get that hmm. that that that's how they. That's how media puts Rand Paul in a box. Okay, here goes Rand Paul. Get ready. This is what you're going to see. But really what you have is a soulless government that is um, aiding and abetting everything that happened here. And it's um, it's disgusting. It's not so, just here, too. Just as a note, yeah, you say aiding and abetting, you soulless government. It's, remember, this is bigger than the United States. Fauci is not only supported by soulless, horrific leadership in this country, but you got to bring in your three-letter organizations. you got to be WHO. willing to bring in yeah. WHO, the WEF. This guy is supported by heavy big pharma institutions. Is a deep, deep darkness. I thought when you said it's not just that, I thought we were getting into Satan con, frankly, because there's a <laughs> deep, I, I, no joke. There yeah. is a deep darkness going on the, the, here, and people don't want to. I know even okay. Tucker invoked the supernatural the other day. Mm -hmm. Something ugly is happening here when it comes to the evilness of these policies. There's something really dark happening. There's a battle of good versus evil. Well, the there cycle, has to be cycle of the fall of man. There has, has to be accountability. There has years. to be accountability. So, by the way, whoever runs next, if there's no accountability, people lose trust in the system. There has to be accountability for what he's doing. Uh, uh, what what is always great? What what is always great is the following. Here's what's always great: is for somebody to invest money into doing a real documentary hmm. on him, who is willing to go do the interviews and the legwork. It may take a million, it may take three million, it may take five million, and Netflix and Hulu and some of these guys may not even take that documentary. You may need to go to a independent OTT to put it out there for people to see. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but somebody m needs to make the right investment maybe even get involved with an RFK from the research st standpoint, go interview some of the older people that used to work at the places and put that documentary up. I'm not talking about like uh, vaxxed or any of that. Give both sides. Give stuff that he's done right. Give stuff that he's won as well. And then give the other side of the argument and then put that documentary out there because somebody like this, if there is anything there, he says we can't talk about blame. <laughs> you, you know, we have to blame <laughs> where the origin came out of. You blamed... Uh, Trump, you blamed a lot of average people that are sitting there saying, dude, I don't want irresponsible governors, irresponsible this. No, there needs to be the blame and, and you being held accountable for it. So this goes to two last stories I got here I want to wrap up with. One, from transgendered to transabled. Guys, this is a real story. Now people are choosing to identify as handicapped. This is not a Joke. onion story. This is not an onion story. This is not a Babylon Bee story. This is a Fox News story. Transableism or body integrity identity disorder. Can you actually Google this to see if this is a real thing? I, I did. Put Matt, it's real. I I D. B I actually go copy paste <laughs> and see if something will come up. B I I D. Okay. It is a societal issue in this is not a this is Pat, NIA. Pat, it's a it's this is real. What? This is not a joke. And it they is just a societal it. issue in which individuals identify as handicapped and may even ask doctors to amputate healthy limbs, snip stifle cords, spinal cords, or destroy eyesight. This term has been relabeled to align with the trans community, with some advocates harnessing the cultural power of gender ideology to cause of allowing doctors to treat BIID patients. Some people with BIID mutilate themselves, which is why culturally transableism is being called the next abyss. The National Institute of Health notes that those with BIID desire for uh, a desire amputations <clears throat> or paralysis. One North Carolina college student has called transableism a cry for attention. An Arizona internist has labeled a dis delusional disorder while some doctors may be willing to perform procedures. Tr these doctors have issues. <laughs> for transableism, most will only perform those they feel are medically indicated. I don't, I don't even know how to, where to start. I can't, I'm flabbergasted. Not, I don't think I've ever used that word. But when are we as a society going to stop pretending, okay? This isn't 
trans it, uh, ableism. It's call it for what it is. It's trans stupidityism. Okay, Pat. These people have mental disorders. Okay, they're dying for attention. And instead of going out, there you go, it's right there. Be, 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 go be an actor. Go go do something. You're gonna cut your li- like one lady. She was on that Dr. Phil jet. She poured acid in her eyes. She's sitting there looking. That she didn't even know where the hell to look. You, how do you think these people that are actually handicapped? What, what, do, what do you mean poured acid on her eyes? This lady, Pat. She she goes. I was born and I identify. I wanted to be handicapped, so she poured acid in her eyes, and she went that blind. That lady, this lady that right lady there? That lady right there. Look at her. And the, Can the, you play this? Play, just play it for the, a second yeah. to see how she sounds. Go ahead. Do you have look any at her. regrets about taking your own vision or the process with which you, you did take your look, own vision? Look. I don't have any regrets taking my vision. I believe I should have been Cleaning. born blind. This is not a spoof. No, I'm not the way I am. Yeah. I do have look at this, some look at regrets reaction. about <laughs> the way I did it, but I'm ha- in the end, I'm happy. It's like a trans version of Jim McMahon. This is unbelievable. This is a, I, I thought it was a spoof. With all due respect look, to Dr. Phil is trying to laugh. I am having so a really hard time. Sitting next to this person. Really hard time. Sitting so close to someone who Needs traumatized to herself, <laughs> who damaged herself. We took an oath in medicine to help people. We see horrible tragedies every single day as doctors and people who would give anything to go back and restore their vision, their health. Jesus. My heart is beating out of my chest. I can't even make sense of the emotions I'm feeling because to hear someone say, I've, o- I've always felt I should be blind. Well, I've o- always felt I should be the Queen, queen of, of England, England, but I'm not going out to become the Queen of England. Yeah, okay. Oh my! Uh, that is a mic drop. And partly because uh, yeah. King Chuck turns and, her off. And listen, I understand. Like, uh, listen, everybody here wants to park in the handicap spot, but chopping off your leg or doing this type of stuff to park close to a building is absurd. And Jed, I, I, I said like a lot of this stems from this whole movement, the whole trans, all of it. I think it started when disciplining your children became taboo. Because think about it. If Pat, be honest. If one day you're like, you know what, Dad. I'm I'm not I'm Patricia. Now, what would your father have done to you, Pat? Be honest with me. What would Gabriel have done? And I'm being genuine with you. If you came home to your dad who's probably watching and you said, Papa, you know what? I have Patrick, this Patrick Schmatrick. I want to be Patricia. What is your father? And you're dead serious. What does your father do to you? I couldn't even tell you because that, that thought is oh confusing for, for, for me to even think about. <laughs> you know, I mean I play, I played a lot of great pranks on the guy that he fell for. But but that this this is above that though. This is like to to allow people to get to this point. The, okay, so we're having this conversation with my sister at the house. Yeah. Okay. We went out this weekend. We're watching the Blue Angels. We had a Amazing. great time. Jets. Amazing. All this. It was sick, right? But we're having this conversation, with my sister, about uh, uh, LGBTQ and the direction it's going and transgender and all this other stuff. I think. You, you, parents are playing a very slippery slope where they're kind of like, no, it's okay, you know, do whatever you want to do. No, no, it's okay, uh, you know, to each his own. No, it's okay. No, it's not to each his own. This person got three and a half million views, mm-hmm. okay? How many other women see this, kids, and they're going to be like, well, I relate to this. If I'm going to get this much eyeballs and I'm finally going to get some attention, I'll do something like this. Of course. I'm willing to do this to my body. And if they don't have love in their household, they don't have any encouragement in their household, nothing like that's going to be happening. Kids are going to make some stupid decisions with their lives because of this. People can't sit on the sidelines and say the argument of it's her choice. Let her do whatever she wants to do with her body. No. You have to have mental issues to be willing to do something like this to yourself. That has to be clear, and it can't be like sitting aside and saying, no, nah, I'm good with my life. I, I think, I think the, the lack of calling out bullshit and calling out you know, uh, 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 insanity is causing a lot of people to think this is the norm. Dwayne Wade the other day said, I have to leave the state of Florida. Uh, because it just didn't match my values and principles. Bye. And we decided to go to a different place where our, you know, son, daughter. Is it a son or a daughter now? What is it now? It's, it's like a, guy, like it's a that, guy that yeah. wants to be a girl. I don't, to honest, I'm confused. Right. I don't know. So, but, but the point is we had to leave the state of Florida. Okay. Well, good for you, bro. Congratulations to wherever else you moved to because you are trying to protect your, 
you know, transgender child. Now, what are you going to say if this 26-year-old kid one day, this kid of yours one day is 26, and says, Dad, why did you let me do that at 13 years old? Sure. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know how old the kid is, by the way. What are you going to do when one day your kid says, Dad, why did you let me go through that process? I was delusional at that time. Then what's your argument going to be, Dad? What are you going to say then? There's a lot of stuff that kids will say to their parents, and 15-year-old, now it's a 15-year-old kid. There's a lot of things that kids will say to their parents. We have to straight up start calling out weird, strange, crazy ideas like this that we're even doing an episode today about transableism. Um, what are your yeah. thoughts on this, Jet? Well, I mean, it, what's interesting is you see the audience reaction, and we can all be like, look at the audience. Look at the people on the yeah. panel. They're all horrified. And my response is give it 10 years. Give it 10 years because, you know what, 20 years ago, if you had brought somebody in that was a child that was on, you know, all these hormone pills and whatnot, and if you looked at mutilation that people are doing to their own bodies, you know, to I'm a girl, I want to be a boy, this, that, people would have <sighs> commented on that in the same way, would have said, well, wait a minute, this is very concerning. But now these same people, if you brought out what I just said, if you brought out people in the trans community and whatnot, these very same people on the panel would be very hesitant to say anything bad about that so you have this like we're adjusting to a new normal all the time and what you have is a lot of people i mean this is mental illness right 100%. i mean a hundred percent something's wrong either it's mental illness or it's social contagion mm -hmm. or it's a desire for popularity and there's been a lot of allegations against ding, ding, dylan ding. mulvaney by the way dylan mulvaney that people say who knew him said oh this is all to get popularity look 100%. at all the money that dylan mulvaney is Rich. making now yep. there are people that are willing to do anything for money yep so I think there's a lot of undiagnosed mental illness. There's a lot of normalization of mental illness. There's a lot of social contagion on social media where people who are lost and struggling and maybe going through some mental stuff on their own think this is their way to find new, oh, this is where I'm really going to find my space where I'm going to be happy. Sure. You see kids being manipulated heavily in those spaces. Did you, did you, see, Duke, did you see Duke Health? Uh, my sister just sent me this. Duke Medicine opened its gender clinic in 2015, okay, and... They offer a wide variety of services under one roof, if you can find this, okay? Put Duke Medicine Gender Clinic, Duke Medicine Gender Clinic, uh, there, right there. So uh, they offer a variety of services under one roof. The clinic treats children as young as two for gender dysphoria. Yeah, this is sickness now. I mean, I have a three-year-old, right? We saw him in and here. this is in Duke University. That's right. And, that, and that's the other thing, that people, people don't take it that extra step because, again— these are the, the the American, you know, all of these traditional medicine facilities. Wow. Again, I always bring in pharma. There's a lot of cash cow here. There's a lot of money to be made off of lifelong commitment to once you have a surgery, you have to take these hormones. There's so much pharma money to be made here that you're going to have media endorsement of strange things. You're going to have, you know, medical institutions that you once deemed respectable and you were like, well, this was a respectable institution. First of all, was it? And secondly, who do they report to? What is their end game? There's a lot of money to be made in this very, very disturbing sick yeah, stuff. And who suffers? People, mostly young young kids that are now being roped into this. I think there's a lot of money under it. When we look back at this in five, ten years, you're going to see the money lines be so clear. I mean, this is Duke. Duke used to be known as slightly more conservative. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, was slightly more liberal. and But they weren't enemies, but they were kind of on a spectrum like that, Pat. That was the difference. And at, um, I think it's Flagler, which was the MBA school at Chapel Hill, and then you had Fuqua, F-U-Q-U-A, um, which was the MBA school at, at Duke. And it was a little bit more conservative, actually a lot more conservative. And now you look and you see the med school that's at Duke, and it's really stark. It's really, those of us that know People that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, graduated either school. I am shocked to see this, but I think there's I think there's a money path here that's even bigger. And I agree with what has already been said. This is all about attention. Everybody wants a box to check to get their attention and to get their their vibe. And you've got people that are doing this for sport. I think when it's I'd love to see where that's Dylan Mulvaney is in 10 years, five years, and find out and find out if he's back on the other side and kind of jokes about the fact that he cast the check okay th th this is crazy to me folks if you're listening to this it's absolute insanity that this is taking place by the way if you enjoy today's podcast 
Uh, I believe uh, Mario and Kai just sent me a message saying we were the number one live on YouTube in America. On the homepage of YouTube, showed us today as a live. We had 10,000 plus people live the entire Let's time. Let's go. Je- Phenomenal job. People love Jed. <laughs> the people they love, love Vinny. They love Tom. This was a great show here today. But we got also a message here, uh, uh, an announcement to make. I want to show you guys a box I just got. I want to show. You got a box? Uh, I got a box. I want to show What's you guys. <laughs> it's a crazy box. What's it's in a, the box? It's a crazy box. If you can bring the box here for us to show to everybody. Oh wow! There's a surprise in so this box. You have a box now. You're not there going is a the other way, small right? little pet that we have. Find if, hey, what? If it's you guys box? can bring it in, can you open the door to if see if they're outside or no? Are you a snake, 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 snake person or no? no? What do you mean? She's like Indiana Jones. Is there a snake coming right, here? Right so now. here's what the box Ryan, is. The box is not a mold lizard. Today, today, and yesterday were Vincent Oshana and Mario Aguilar's birthday. So come on in. We got to sing happy birthday. You got me to Vincent Oshana and Mario Aguilar. Come around, Mario. Come around on three. We'll sing along. If you guys know Mario, VT wouldn't be what it is without Mario and uh, Vinny's birthday today as well. On three, we got to sing for you guys. On three, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Vinny and Mario. Happy birthday to you. You guys, we're, we're both 25 years old. 25 years old, look how good we look. I love it. Can I do a quick Sexy as So tell us, go ahead. Shout out to the entire audience because we, without you guys watching, we wouldn't have a Vi team of brand. Shout out to PBD. I've never met somebody who can outlast this long. I've been working with you for 18 years. And uh, if it wasn't for Patrick sticking it out, we wouldn't be here. Shout out to our team who makes every day possible and to our talent. Who has, uh, makes the future look bright. Thank you, everybody. Mario, and shout out to your future son. One Let's month go, away. baby. Oh, oh, my Barbie bear. It's Barbie. Exciting, Barbie. I love you guys. Right. That was awesome. Listen, Thank you guys again, so much. Listen, hey, uh, uh, again, congrats. Happy birthday to you guys. Cake, Jet, you have a show today or your show's uh, when, no, Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday? No, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 1 p.m. Eastern time. Be there. 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Tom, next waves. Monday, what Vin- you got going on? The Vincent on? O'Shaughnessy Show. It's a comedy uh, variety show. It's on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern can, time. Eastern yep. Standard time. We Put have the fun. links to everybody <laughs> under description so they know to go <laughs> find them. Kiss Gang, Doc, Monday, 11.30 a.m. Gang, Eastern. we will do this again. Do we have podcasts on Thursday or no? We do. It'll be at 12. 12 o'clock on Thursday uh, with Peter Navarro. Peter Navarro is yes, Okay, oh, sounds nice. good. So Wednesday, no, Thursday, 12 o'clock, Peter Navarro. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Hey, you got me good.